Good morning. Welcome to day two of the California Transportation Commission. This is uh, our Thursday day two meeting, and we are delighted that you could join us for this meeting. Douglas, could you please read the roll? Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes, sir. Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Eager. Here. Commissioner Grisby. Present. Commissioner Guardino. Present. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tavoloni. Chair Norton. Present. Senator Newman. Assemblymember Friedman. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. Douglas, could you please read the instructions for public comment today? Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to day two of the June 2021 CTC virtual meeting. Please use the questions tab if you have questions for the staff about operation of the meeting. Commissioner Kehoe, I saw you were now present. I'll mark you uh, down on the roll call. Thank you, Doug. Ladies and gentlemen, the CTC exists to make transportation planning, funding, and policy more understandable and accountable. Our meetings normally take place in diverse locations around the state so that commissioners can see firsthand the, a variety of infrastructure issues around California. However, containment measures surrounding COVID-19 have required us to adjust to a webinar format. Please bear with us should we encounter any technical challenges. The Commission's meeting agenda is located under the Handouts tab and can be downloaded and saved during the webinar. It can also be found on the Commission's website. Live closed captioning is being provided in the webinar for this meeting. The link to view the live captions can be found on our meetings page under the June 23rd, 24th meeting heading. Commissioner, should you have any questions or comments during our meeting, please let us know by raising your hand or otherwise get our attention on, on your camera and wait for the chair to call on you. You can also send inquiries and comments through the questions tab that can be read to presenters and the audience on your behalf. Please mute your microphone except when you intend to speak to minimize outside noise and feedback. The chair will do her best to call on each of you in turn. We hope that you will turn on your camera while speaking if you have one. Because this meeting is not an in-person meeting, every vote will need to be a roll call vote. Staff will group items for votes to help save time. Please only speak when called upon. When called upon, state your name and briefly make your point. I would please ask that no one speaks a second time on any one item until everyone who wishes to speak a first time has done so. Presenters, if you're on the agenda to make a presentation, please do your best to be succinct. We hope that you will also tr turn on your camera during your presentation if you have one. For the members of the public, we welcome comments from the public as part of each each item at this meeting. We encourage you to use the raise hand feature as early into the item as you can as you can to give the system time to acknowledge you. For participants joining through the GoToWebinar system, please find the webinar panel likely located on the right hand side of your screen. There you will find the audio questions and handouts tabs. Under the audio tab, attendees will have the choice to listen via the computer or telephone option. Should you prefer computer option, please ensure the appropriate box is selected. If you choose the phone call option, select the corresponding box and dial the phone number, access code, and audio pin as directed by the automated system. Please note that if the audio pin is not entered, you will remain in listen only mode and will be unable to speak to the commission should you have a comment. As a reminder, each registered attendee is provided a unique link and phone number to access the webinar. These cannot be shared with other participants as they are registered to you alone. There are two options for participants to provide comments on the agenda items. Click the hand icon to indicate you wish to make a comment. You will then be unmuted and called upon to make your comment. Please be sure to state your name and affiliation if you have any prior to voicing your remarks. Alternately, you may use the questions tab. Type in, you may use the question tab. Type in the agenda item number you are commenting on and your comment. Commission staff will read the comment on your behalf. For all of our commenters, please do your best to be concise with your comments. Also, please make sure that your comments add new information. If you agree with the comments of a previous speaker, simply make that statement. 
Since we often have many speakers, we ask that you make your point in three minutes or less. If for some reason we have many speakers on a topic, we reserve the right to limit comments to one minute if needed. A timer may be displayed on screen during the public comments. You will not be able to be on camera while making your comments. Thank you for joining us today. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. Thank you so much, Douglas. And for participants today, because we are going to have um, various people coming in to speak on these items and that there are some key issues we want to get addressed while we have the right council uh, commissioners in the room, we definitely will be jumping around and we appreciate your patience today. Very first item we're going to take up is item 81, the director's deed for Union City, Gertesh. Good morning, Chair Norton. Good morning, commissioners. Item 81 is an action item for a direct sale of excess land to a public agency. The direct sale is for the appraised fair market value of $86,184,000 to the city of Union City. The properties comprising the sale were originally purchased by Caltrans for the State Route 84 238 interchange, which was part of the State Route 84 realignment project. Legislation that was passed in 2008 created a separate local area transportation improvement program, or LATIP, for State Route 84. The commission approved the LATIP in 2009, which would provide funding from the sale of excess state owned properties that were originally purchased for the State Route 84 realignment project. Commission staff evaluated the merit of the direct sale and its applicability with Resolution G9822. Staff found that Caltrans met the resolution requirements for direct sales to a public agency. Finally, staff received a signed memo from Union, Union City's city manager stating that any additional proceeds above the appraised $86 million value from the city's sale to a third party developer shall be directed back into the lay tip as well. Please also make note of the change list as there is an associated meeting handout with this item. And Chair Norton, at your discretion, I believe we have Caltrans District 4 Director Dina L. Tawansi online to provide additional comment on this item. So if we can please have Director L. Tawansi unmuted. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions or is Caltrans going to make a brief presentation? Hi, this is Kimberly Erickson. I'm the Division Chief of Right-of-Way Land Surveys. I am here just to um, reach out, and it looks like Dean is having some technical issues. So I'd like to call upon Resham Haddix. Resham, okay. are you there? Great. And we, I think we're aware that the Assemblywoman Cork Silva wanted to speak on this item. Um, Justin, have you been aware whether she has been and her staff are ready? Uh, Madam Chair, I think that may be Assembly uh, Member uh, Bill Quirk. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, on our agenda, it was it was written differently. If uh, Assembly Member Bill Quirk is ready, then I'm um, ready to hear from him. My well, my apologies, Chair. That was my fault. We do not see Bill Quirk on. Okay. Um, out of deference, I'd like to hold this on the desk until we hear from him uh, and because I think he was intending to speak. So let's move on to the next item. Uh, item 80 is the uh, director's deed, Route 710, Gertesh. Yes, thank you again, Chair Norton. Item 80 is an action item for a direct sale of excess land along the State Route 710 corridor in Los Angeles County. The property in question is a 16,000 square foot lot containing an 8,400 square foot multifamily residence. It is being directly sold to Pasadena Friendship Community Development Corporation for the reasonable sale price of $879,300. The reasonable sale price was set in accordance with the Roberti Act and the Affordable Sales Program. According to the Roberti Act, the reasonable sales price is determined by a housing related entity for use as affordable housing. Also in accordance with the Roberti Act, the private housing related entity known as Pasadena Friendship 
set the reasonable sales price at Caltrans's minimum sales price established for the property. The established reasonable sales price is the property's original acquisition price adjusted for inflation. Roberti Act regulations under the Affordable Sales Program Section 1477 require a prioritization evaluation when Caltrans proposes excess land sales of State Route 710 properties. Please make note of the change list as there is an associated yellow supplemental narrative and a meeting handout with this item. And to provide more context on Caltrans's compliance with the Roberti Act priority requirements, we have the Caltrans Division Chief of Right-of-Way and Land Surveys, Kimberly Erickson, online to offer additional details. I really appreciate you, Kimberly, your presence here today. We have a number of uh, people who want to speak in public comment, so we'll take public comment first so that we can um, prepare questions for you. Is that okay? Wonderful. Okay, Justin, could you please um, allow us to have the public comment? Yes, thank you, Chair Norton. Uh, up first, we have Mark Gallatin. Mark, you're free to unmute yourself and make your comment. Good morning, Chair Norton and honorable commissioners. My name is Mark Gallatin. I'm the president of the South Pasadena Preservation Foundation. I'm here today to say that our foundation stands in solidarity with the city of South Pasadena and the tenants of 626 Prospect Avenue on the matter before you today. We believe that the city's proposal for this property complies with the spirit and letter of all applicable statutes and regulations, including the Roberti Law. The city of South Pasadena has, demonst has a demonstrated track record of successfully participating in and facilitating the sale of surplus Caltrans properties. Therefore, we respectfully ask that you reject or at least defer conveyance of the surplus property at 626 Prospect Avenue, as it is the subject of pending litigation that is working its way through the judicial system. Thank you for your time and consideration on this matter. Thank you, appreciate your time. Next speaker. Up next, we have Sean uh, Abijain. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, uh, Chair Norton and CTC commissioners. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak before you. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Shauna Bachan, and I am the president of New Prospects Housing, representing the tenants of 626 Prospect Avenue. I'm also a tenant of 626 Prospect Avenue myself, along with my wife and baby daughter. Um, I'm asking you to vote against the sale uh, because Caltrans has both violated the spirit and the letter of the Roberti Law by denying the tenant initiated plan to purchase this building so that we can become uh, 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 homeowners. Uh, under the law, the priority of uh, sale was given first to public HREs and the city of South Pasadena through its public housing agency submitted a plan to purchase the building. In that plan, the city would then sell the building to New Prospect Development, of which New Prospect Housing is a partner uh, together with Heritage Housing Partners. Uh, this was a tenant-initiated effort. Uh, we are, uh, we went to great ex, uh, extent uh, in using uh, in, in uh, using time and resources uh, to be able to come uh, together with a plan uh, that the city submitted as the public HRE and uh, we're deeply troubled uh, that this plan has been disregarded it's a very innovative plan uh, and uh, uh, working with a um, a nonprofit developer with years of experience of uh, doing this exact thing. Uh, so we uh, again respectfully uh, request uh, that uh, uh, the commission uh, 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 deny uh, approval of this uh, action item or at the very least postpone uh, any action on the item until the courts have had a chance to hear the city's lawsuit on this matter and render a verdict. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Up next, we have John Premuth. Good morning, commissioners. I'm John Premuth. I'm on the city council of the city of South Pasadena. And uh, in your packet, our city manager has submitted a letter opposing approval of the uh, this, this agenda item. Uh, the city has filed uh, a lawsuit to stop the sale. 
uh, that hearing on that is is set for a TRO hearing on July 2nd. So uh, the technical points of our lawsuit are stated in that letter, but the, the bottom line, I think, and the biggest um, irritant in, in why we went forward with the lawsuit is that the city's priority under the Roberti Act regulations was ignored. Uh, the city proposed a, a reasonable price statement and should have qualified as a public housing related entity. And th those entities have priority over private housing related entities. And that's pretty much the, the, the case in a nutshell. Um, yeah. And so we think that, that there was an inappropriate interpretation of the regulations. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to um, couch this in maybe a bigger context. Uh, yesterday, I listened to the, uh, the commission's agenda and, and saw all the new exciting directions and priorities that you have. Um, these surplus properties on the 710 corridor uh, are, are your old business. And what we would like to do as a city, and this may be able to be a pilot program for the entire corridor, is present a set of policies for the commission to adopt that would work in tandem with the affordable sales program, where the community and the city would work with Caltrans to expedite and facilitate a quicker disposition of these properties. Now, this is under the existing rules, uh, and the city has a lot of energy around this project. Uh, you heard from our mayor back in January. You'll also hear from another council member today. So hopefully, as you think about partnering with communities, uh, you'll also know that we are uh, working very closely with the tenant organizations. So the tenants who need to receive priority, we're going to be helping them as well. Uh, you also may know that there's pending legislation known as SB 381 uh, yes. proposed by Senator Anthony Portentino. Uh, the city strongly supports that bill. And if it were to become law, then our effort would be to facilitate sales under that bill. But before that bill is enacted, if it's ever enacted, uh, we still want to work within the existing rules with Caltrans staff on sort of a streamlined process. And we hope to bring that to you before your next meeting. And that way you can have a set of policies, I think, gets this old business off your plate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker. Justin, are we done with um, testimony or there's another? Yes, Chair Norton. Uh, I see no other attendee indicating they wish to make public comment at this time. Okay, um, commissioners, do any of you wish to speak on this item? Uh, Commissioner Liu? Well, I just, um, I, I know that council member Cacciotti is, was waiting to speak on this item. So is there a way to see if uh -huh. he's there? I thought so as well. Um, while we're waiting, uh, Ms. Erickson, I wanted to ask, is there any, um, pending issue that requires us to take an action today versus con continuing this to August where we would have more time for this discussion and uh, for understanding what's happening within the courts and to see whether or not the Portentino bill is, is uh, uh, questions. Uh, there's a little, there's a sec one second, one second. Excuse me. Is, is that the person who's trying to speak as part of public comment? No, that was a mistake. They had to be muted. Okay. Um, my question is, is it possible to continue this until the Portentino bill is um, approved or dispensed with it and, and let this play out? And then I would like to move this also to my colleagues who have questions. Thank you for that question, Chair Norton. Your, your question is an excellent one. So we're here before the commission today to um, seek approval of this transaction simply because we are, uh, we initially were looking at a July date for a close of escrow and that close of escrow date was moved to August with mutual agreement with the prospective buyer. And um, without getting the approval today, we will not have enough time uh, to actually close escrow in keeping with the contract and maybe in a potential breach. 
if I may, I would like to say that um, approval of this item today would not mean that Caltrans would close escrow. It would simply mean that Caltrans would have time to close escrow in the event that in the court matter, uh, the court finds in our favor. And I hope I answered your question. But, it, but knowing that the uh, uh, person that you're in party with escrow with understands that this is the subject of court, do they understand that escrow may not close by the intended August period anyway? They, I'm sure, are aware of the active litigation now. Um, however, we've not had discussions with them about pushing the close of escrow date out at this time. Okay. Um, well, I see, uh, first, Commissioner Liu, did you have uh, comments other than waiting for the South Pasadena council member to speak? I saw um, your video yes, first. Uh, I, I do. <laughs> We were still trying to see if council member Cacciati was was uh, waiting, but I thought he was. Um, that notwithstanding, I I um, I understand that that Caltrans and, and staff believe that they followed the Roberti Act. I have listened to the um, concerns from City of South Pasadena and others that they didn't. I know that the the um, there's a hearing coming up on the lawsuit. And I am concerned that that Caltrans could be in breach of contract if they prevail in the lawsuit between now and some future time where we can consider this. At the same time, I am impressed and interested in pursuing uh, the offer from the city of South Pasadena to try to figure out a way to do this in a less yes. confrontational um, and more sort of productive and cooperative manner. Uh, in dealing with these properties and, you know, working with uh, Senator Portantino and other elected officials in doing so. So I have a proposal um, and uh, if everyone's done with the public comment, I would like to make a motion. Well, that... Council Member Cacciati is on since, okay. since your question. So let's have him participate in public comment i think because you want to make your proposal after that is that correct yes that, that'd be fine thank okay. you justin could we get the council I member hello hello you're on hello uh madam chair can you hear me yes we can thank you madam chair commissioners and staff my name is Michael Cacciotti, the mayor pro tem of the historic city of South Pasadena. Madam Chair, I've been on the council for 20 years, and prior to that, from 91 to 2001, I was a deputy attorney with the great Department of Transportation, Caltrans. Prior to that, Madam Chair, I was a staffer for assembly member, speaker pro tem Mike Roos, who shared the district boundaries with state senator David Roberti, the author of the Roberti Act. So I've been involved with these issues, fortunately or unfortunately, for 30 years. <laughs> Um, over the past 20 years, Madam Chair, I've made it a priority for our city and community to work closely and collaboratively and cooperatively with the Department of Transportation and the Commission. So today, the City of South Pasadena, as Councilmember Primeth stated, we and all of our community groups and citizens want to work collaboratively and cooperatively and continue that relationship we've built over the past several years to address transportation housing, and as my good friend Joe Lou knows, air quality issues. Today is part of our efforts at the state and local level to address the severe shortage of housing. We would respectfully request that you deny or in the alternative, postpone your decision on this matter to a later date. The city believes, and we can talk about this later, that there's been an unreasonable interpretation of the Roberti Act and also the affordable sales program provisions in this specific context at 626 Prospect Avenue, which results, we believe, in an act act and result not contemplated by the author, Dave Roberti, or my former boss, Mike Roos, who dealt with these issues for many years, and actually contrary to the legislative intent that's been developed since it's passed in 1979. It would result in irreparable harm to Sean and Susie Abajan and their beautiful child that was just born in their effort to achieve the American dream and get affordable uh, housing. Now, 
as part of our efforts, we're inviting you, Madam Chair, and the commissioners to the beautiful, historic, quaint city of South Pasadena to mm -hmm. schedule a tour and inspection of some of these 68 properties, which unfortunately, and I can tell you, I, I went in some for some evictions back in 95, they're in dilapidated condition. And some of the experts on the border have construction experience. And I worked with the contractors board for the attorney general for the last 20 years. We want to take you on our tour. We want to sit down with you after that and see how we can discuss and work together to address some of these issues in, this, in a civil matter. Work with not only you, District 7, Senator Portentino, and other elected officials to work for an inclusive and expeditious disposition of these properties. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Liu, we want to make sure you finish your proposal, but we do have many count, uh, commissioners who want to speak on this item as well. How, however you'd like to handle it, uh, Chair Norton, I, we can hear from the other commissioners first before I'm okay. you. Okay, yes, let's do that. Uh, Vice Chair Alvarado. Uh, just a couple of questions, and I, and I understand this is a pretty contentious uh, issue here. Um, understanding that we're, we're getting into um, litigation, has uh, has anybody filed for a restraining order? In what I'm getting at is, have have the courts taken a cursory look at this thing, um, and and issued a restraining order to stop moving forward on the sale? Has it been attempted, or just a question? That's another wonderful question, and and I do actually have. Um Carolyn Dabney on the line, who has some good detail on that matter in particular. Carolyn, I'd love for you to jump in. So, good morning. I would like to say that a, a chair, can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. We can hear you. Yes, good. Good morning, Chair Norton and Commissioners. Uh, yes, there was a hearing last week, I believe, and the TRO was denied by the court on the premise that Caltrans was not going to close the escrow uh, prior to the July 1st hearing. So the TRO was denied. So so we we did go to court and they took a look at at the process and, and the restraining order was denied. Yes, that that's, correct. that's correct. Okay. Um, okay, then my second question is, this, this looks like it's gonna get even messier. Uh, and that would be uh, because I'm, I'm, in, I'm inclined if, if, we, if we can't all come to an agreement to postpone this thing for a month. And because it looked at initially by the courts and the court was denied a restraining order, then I would I would tend to, to favor the recommendation. So um, I think maybe it, I've seen on a note here that uh, Assembly Member Quirk is on board um if we couldn't again have the parties get together uh maybe agree to a month extension so this doesn't get all weirded out go back <laughs> go back to item 81 and maybe try and finish that and then come back to item 80 and and while we're doing that i gotta go outside and talk to my general president make sure i can stay on the line and it's just i'm trying to get we're trying to get something done here without yep. a whole bunch of money being spent on litigation that we could spend on affordable housing. So Fair Madam enough. Chair, it's up to you. It's up to them, I think. Okay. May I, um, go ahead. May I add one comment? Um, I did want to mention that the court has taken the August close of escrow date into consideration in setting the hearing date. And so that's something that the court was looking at as well in setting up that hearing date of July 1. Okay. Okay. There are three more attendees that wish to speak um, from on the, in the public side. So, uh, Commissioner Alvarado, you were asking us, because now we have Assembly Member uh, Quirk ready to speak on 81, you want us to go back to 81 to make sure we can dispense of that and then take this up again because we have a lot more people who are here wishing to speak. Well, if 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 the parties here, just like we had, you know, several other occasions, if yep. the parties can agree to a one month extension, then that makes our job pretty easy. Yeah. If they can agree on a one month extension, then it's going to get contentious. And and frankly, I'm going to agree with the court and 
If there's a motion to deny, then I'm going to vote against it. If there's a motion to approve, then I'm going to support it. And I think rather than than get into this um, messy situation right now, if we could come up with with a right. simple solution, it would make everybody's job a lot easier. It's going to save a whole lot of money on litigation. Mm -hmm. And then we can move forward from there. Thank you, you so much, Vice Chair Alvarado. I see that we have. <laughs> Say this one more time. I, I just wanted to ask Kimberly: is, is the party to whom this this would potentially be sold on on the line or available now to have that discussion about whether they would be willing to accept a postponement? Well, if it, it Mitch, this is Commissioner Davis. I mean, if it has to close by August, uh, that that that's weeks after. Uh, it's got plenty of time to close weeks after. Our next meeting so i don't right. see where postponing this hurts us uh, i don't know what commissioner Lou's uh, motion was going to be but i don't see where postponing this until after our next meeting gives everybody as commissioner alvarado described a chance to uh maybe find a, a, right. a equi equitable solution for everybody uh, but we would have time to act on it uh after you know, make a decision to the next meeting and uh, uh, and then would give them several weeks to close escrow. And if it's all teed up to close already, um, <laughs> you know, that shouldn't be that much trouble to do in uh, the subsequent weeks after the commission meeting. Um, yeah, so sure, enough, I'll let Excuse me, I, I'm sorry, we're, we're talking over each other. Let, let, please let, um, Executive Director Weiss speak, and then I'll go to you, Commissioner Liu, and then I would like to make sure Commissioners Kehoe and Gardino and the three other people are um, who are in the line for public comment get to speak, but I also do not like having um, Assembly Member Quirk wait because we were waiting for to complete the previous item for just his input. So let's start with Mitch, then you, Commissioner Liu, and then let's move forward expeditiously. I, I was just going to suggest we we turn it to Caltrans to speak to uh, after our August commission meeting, which is, uh, I believe, the second week in, in August. Do we have time? Do they have time to uh, finish up escrow, or and what would be the impact? Kimberly, Kimberly. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is Karen. I'll I'll take that. Um, you know, the, the issues that the CTC Commission is, is bringing up, the, those are issues that are for resolving in the preliminary injunction, which is scheduled on July 1st. The problem with postponing is our escrow is scheduled to close August 2nd, um, and I believe the Commission meeting is scheduled after that date. So we could be potentially in breach. But, um, for, let me go to Joe, and as I said, promise, to Commissioner Kehoe and Commissioner Gardino, and then I have a question. So, Commissioner no, no, Liu? I, I think I, my, my proposal would, would deal with that scenario and avoid the situation where Caltrans would be in a breach if the court ruled in their favor. And that would be that uh, a motion to conditionally approve this item by, by as proposed by staff, but that the condition be that should the court rule in a manner that would compel Caltrans to complete the sale of this property prior to our next meeting, we will consider the director's deed granted. If not, we will delay approval and further consideration until our next meeting, which will give us a chance to meet with the officials from the city of South Pasadena, other stakeholders between now and then, and try to iron out uh, this, this issue. So it would be a proposal to do a conditional approval. And Madam Chair, if that's a motion by Commissioner Liu, I would yes. second his motion. Uh, Okay, we still have further discussion and further input. Commissioner Kehoe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just thought from a protocol perspective, if, if that wasn't a, a motion, that it wouldn't die for lack of a second. And I leave, I I, I leave that all up to you. You've seconded the motion, but we still have further discussion um, and input in, in, in process. So I want to make sure we get a chance to hear everyone else and we'll have that motion in second on the table. Commissioner Absolutely. Kehoe. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, the Okay, we know this is a very contentious issue, has been for years. 
when I see the 710 on any agenda, I get a upset stomach. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I am not prepared to uh, go forward with a, you know, even a conditional motion for sale, uh, as long as the state senator and various officials at the city and the, and some residents are so adamantly opposed. And I have to say, um, uh, you know, how Caltrans with its, you know, very talented people, legal departments, et cetera, gets itself in these jams over real estate is a very frustrating thing. And I'll just add quickly, uh, when I was a city council member, we completed the I-15 corridor through my district, uh, the City Heights area, uh, working with Caltrans closely and the neighborhoods, and we got it done and it was successful. It can be done. I don't know why. Uh, the 710 is always a headbanger, uh, but I'm not prepared to vote against the city and the and the state senator. So, um, yeah. uh, Commissioner Liu, I just uh, I don't want to uh, support a motion that's conditional on things outside our control happening. I Absolutely. guess. That's Thank you Thank very much for that um, wise uh, statement, Commissioner Kehoe. Um, I am in the same place. Ms. Erickson, I do not want to move forward with this sale. And I guess one question I have for you is all of these um, agreements are conditional on CTC vote. And we can vote to deny this sale. We don't have to even vote to continue it. If we vote to deny the sale, what happens and, and restart the process under potentially the Portentino legislation, et cetera, then what happens? It seems like maybe limbo is worse than just outright denying the sale and starting over listening to what we're hearing from South Pasadena. So if you deny the sale, we could of course be in, in potential breach of contract. Um, the, the way in which we got to the priority in looking at the public or private housing related entities in which these proposals fell was in strict compliance with the Roberti regulation. So I would imagine that if we didn't move forward, uh, perhaps we might, perhaps we might have to go back through the waterfall unless we would simply freeze here. I'm, I'm quite frankly not clear on what would happen if we were not to approve it here today, but I can tell you that if the Roberti regulations continue as they are on the books today, that we would still ultimately be in the same place with two public or private HREs. Well, Ms. Erickson, what I'd like to do is have you find out the answer to that question. I'm gonna make sure we hold item 80 on the desk because we now have all the people that were trying to come in on 81. I'd like to have all the people that were ready to testify on 80 still be ready. And for you all, as our vice chair stated, look at a way in which we could create an additional window to find some other common ground. And we will come back to this item. And please let us know when you found out the um, answer to the question about what if we just denied the sale now so that we, are, we left the limbo out of the question, okay? And, and Chairman, um, if, if I could, I, when we do return to this item, I, I want to also make sure that Caltrans has the chance to give their side of the story and provide their narrative as far as uh, following the priority requirements as well and answering those questions. Happy to do that. I just want to make sure we can get all, all we now have all the stuff on the table. I'm mm -hmm. interested in hearing from Caltrans. I'd like to dispense with item 81 now that we have the elected officials ready to speak and we can dispense of that item and come back when everybody's ready and with the answer to my question about the denial of the sale. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. I know you're on the previous item too. So um, let's go back to item 81 with all the other testimony um, ready to be presented for 81. Justin. Yes. Up first, we have Assembly Member Bill Quirk. Assembly Member Quirk, you're free to unmute yourself and make your comment. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I apologize for not being able to log on earlier. Uh, the administrator of our Assembly computers know better than I, and 
wouldn't let me on webinar. So I'm on my regular computer. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I very much support uh, the conveyance of the Caltrans land to Union City. Uh, prior to my election in 2012, I was on the Hayward City Council, a city which has made a major commitment uh, to developing housing, particularly affordable housing. And I moved to Union City uh, three years ago, and I'm very impressed by the dedication of the uh, city council here, as well as, uh, frankly, the people of Union City uh, to building for to building this housing around the BART station, uh, hopefully someday also along a Amtrak line. And it is, um, I think, the highest and best use of this land. Uh, they will still be building the Quarry Lakes Parkway, which will help uh, get, um, uh, which will help get uh, the uh, information uh below the excuse me will help get people through the town um and right now the station district was formerly um contaminated land it has now been cleaned up uh, and i very much like the land sale proceeds from the caltrans property to fund the key transportation processes projects listed in the lay tip again uh, these are, this is a city council, this is a city that truly wants to build that housing and also to finish up uh, the project which will connect, uh, be an east-west connector from our main drag Mission Boulevard over to uh, Highway 880. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're so delighted that you weighed in today. Uh, next speaker. Thank you. Up next, we have Carol Dudra Bernacci. Carol, you are muted and free to make your comment. Okay, well, while Carol's getting that sorted out, can we, uh, we will move on to Lily May. Yes. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm Lily May, and I'm the mayor of the city of Fremont, and I'm pleased to be joining together with Union City in support of this agenda item to allow Union City to be the lead on selling this surplus state highway property. For the city of Fremont, I'd like to highlight two important projects that will be delivered from the surplus land sale agreed to as part of our local area transportation improvement plan. One project will provide a state of good repair improvements along the relinquished portion of former State Route 84, which um, could travels through Fremont. This includes portions of Thornton Avenue, Fremont Boulevard, Peralta Boulevard, and Maori Avenue. These roads are currently in poor condition and are urgent need of repair and improvement to transform them into safe and complete streets. These roads pass along several schools, the historic Centerville Business District, and the ACE train station. The second project will upgrade Dakota Road to a multimodal corridor with a dedicated busway for AC Transit's Dumbarton Express service and with upgraded facilities for walking and bicycling. So I just wanted to thank you today for your time and consideration, and we look forward to a continued partnership to improving transportation in California. And so thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Up next. Thank you. Up next, we have Robert Dalton. Hi, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Robert Dalton. I'm a founding member of a local Niles community groups, uh, Niles for Environmentally Safe Trains, as well as Protect Niles. In uh, 2007, after 12 years of effort, the seven mile section of California, Highway 84 along Niles Canyon Road was dedicated as a scenic highway. 
the city of Fremont, Union City, and Alameda County jointly submitted a scenic corridor protection plan to safeguard and steward this repository of natural beauty and resources and the source of much of our community's drinking water. Currently, there are a variety of pressures coming to bear upon this area of environmental significance. Among the most troubling of them is the potential east-west connector. This proposed road threatens to turn the canyon route and the watershed source into a thoroughfare for considerably more induced traffic and promises potential road widening to four lanes through the, through the canyon and possible degradations of the protections of the scenic character of the Niles Canyon. The county and city signatories to the protection plan have a responsibility of stewardship for the canyon, one of the few scenic highways in the Bay Area. I would ask the commission to support this responsibility and reconsider the Highway 84 surplus land sale to Union City by voting no on this agenda item and confirming your commitment to the preservation of the scenic corridor to our watershed and our communities. Thank you. Okay, uh, next speaker, it's my understand, uh, it's my understanding that um, uh, Carol Dutra, who's the mayor of Union City, Vernacci is, and um, there are others who are trying to speak on this item still? Yes, uh, we, we attempted to uh, provide Carol opportunity, but uh, when I'm muted, it was not able to speak, so I will reattempt at this time. Um, Carol, you are now unmuted and free to make your comment. Can you hear me now? We can. Perfect. Chair Norton and members of the commission, I am Carol Dutra Vernacci, the mayor of Union City, a member of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, a member of the Alameda County Transportation Commission, and a lifelong resident of Union City. I am speaking in support of the CTC's conveyance of the approximately 35 acres of Caltrans owned property to the city of Union City to enable the construction of affordable housing near our BART station. The land sale proceeds from the conveyed property will fund transportation projects identified in the local transportation improvement plan, which the CTC approved at its December 30th, 2009 meeting. Projects identified in the late tip for funding include reimbursing VTA for constructing the I-880 Mission Boulevard interchange in support of the BART to San Jose effort, paying Fremont to restore historic Route 84 to Fremont standards, and closing the construction funding gap for Quarry Lakes Parkway segments 3 and 4. The Caltrans property is currently zoned for a minimum of 300 residential units at a townhouse density. A specific plan is underway that will allow for higher densities. After the Caltrans property is conveyed to Union City, as required by the Surplus Lands Act, Union City will offer the property for purchase to affordable housing developers who will be obligated to construct a minimum of 25% affordable units. In addition to funding the late tip, the Caltrans property will provide needed right-of-way to construct the Quarry Lakes Parkway, a new multimodal corridor that will provide a critical second point of access to Union City's Station District. The Station District is a high-density walkable community composed of 3,000 new and entitled housing units adjacent to the Union City BART Station. Approximately 15% of the residential units in the entire station district are affordable family units. These affordable units are in addition to the affordable housing that will be constructed on the Caltrans property. The Class 1 bicycle paths built in conjunction with the Quarry Lakes Parkway will provide new safe access from the homes in the station district to Quarry Lakes Regional Park and regional trails maintained by the East Bay Regional Park District. Union City will adhere to the Caltrans Office of Cultural Resources Studies findings and require the developer to preserve the half acre Peterson Ranch as a public park and to preserve as many adjacent significant resources as feasible, such as the mature trees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the CTC property conveyance to the city of Union City. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, does that conclude our public testimony today, Justin? Uh, no, Chair Norton. We have uh, four more attendees at this time looking to make public comment. Uh, okay. Up next, we we have up next Marcella Renzi. Marcella, you're free to unmute yourself and make your comment. 
Good morning, commissioners and staff. I am Marcella Renzi of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, BTA. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this sale to the city of Union City. As you heard earlier, BTA is the sponsoring agency of one of the late tip projects. BTA also greatly supports walkable, bikeable, transit oriented communities such as Union City is planning to build. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Next we have Dave Campbell. Good morning, commissioners. Dave Campbell, Advocacy Director with Bike East Bay. We are a walking and bicycling nonprofit advocacy group in Alameda and Contra Costa counties, including in Union City and the Tri-City area. Uh, here, calling in to oppose the sale of this land uh, because uh, officials are trying to build an oversized freeway through this area. And this land is not needed for the local road that would serve the station district between Alvarado Niles Road and State Route 238. It goes further to the west and is not needed for that purpose. And I'm certainly not surprised to hear Assemblymember Court paused when he spoke and tried to explain the need for this road. In fact, I counted, he paused three times. He struggled in his comments to tell you why this freeway was needed. And I'm not surprised to hear him struggle to do that. I would struggle to do it too. We asked Union City, the Alameda County Transportation Commission asked Union City to redo the traffic analysis. And the only thing they did, and they did it in bad faith, was answer the question, if we build a four lane roadway, will it fill up with cars? And the consultant answered the question, yes. That is the old Caltrans, the old commission way of doing things, not the new way going forward. There's so many more questions that need to be answered other than if we build it, it will fill up with cars. And that's why the traffic analysis for this project is flawed. And it's, it makes it very clear to all of us, they're just trying to build a new freeway from the Tri-Valley all the way through this area. And for that reason, we oppose it. We do want a walkable, bikeable neighborhood. We want affordable housing, but we want to do it right. And we want to do it financially responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, Chair Norton, I see one more attendee indicating they wish to make comment at this time. Up next, we have Elizabeth Ames. Good morning, uh, Chair Norton and commissioners. Um, I'm asking the com commission to pause, stop, reconsider Highway 84 surplus land sale to Union City by voting no and deferring this item. We need a new solution on how to resolve, resolve the motorists passing through our communities. You had mentioned, you had heard uh, Fremont mayor talk about the relinquishment of Highway 84 through Fremont and the sale of the land would fund the, you know, to fix this road and to good repair. But really the highway needs to, the highway needs to be recognized because the highway being extended to Livermore is happening right now from 680 and uh, Niles Canyon to the east all the way to Livermore, which then goes into 580 to the Altamont Pass. So this is a Tri-Valley and San Joaquin Valley. And then 84 dives down to two lanes at Niles Canyon, only to pick up on the Fremont side, but Fremont's being relinquished. So now it's going to be this east-west connector, a four-lane expressway that widens to six lanes to I-880, then then ticks folks over the Dumbarton Bridge, which is, you know, where all the jobs are. So essentially the state needs to be accountable. Really look at this project, spanning from 84, uh, spanning from the Dumbarton Bridge to on 84 through to Livermore. And to do that, I think that the, the Caltrans and this commission needs to basically perform a feasibility study and develop a strategy to connect 84 to I-880. That's really the gap. There is no state highway unless you use this east-west connector. Um, and I guess the state wants to relinquish this and call this a local road. It's almost like, you know, looking for a scapegoat by designating it as surplus lands. When Caltrans needs to really, and this, and this commission needs to look at this 
as a highway system connection. Please find a remedy, vote no, and defer this item. And hopefully we can build a transit-oriented BART station. I am a BART director, and we've got over a 1,000 people protesting and asking for a better solution. So I hope this commission can help. Thank you so much. And Niles Canyon is the most amazing place. It is really like the Lake Tahoe of Alameda County. I hope you guys can all go there. It's amazing. And it is our water supply. So I appreciate the time tonight, today, this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's time for us. So um, Vice Chair Alvarado, I know you were eager to make some um, comments. Uh, no, I, I was just gonna say this is, uh, you know, you, you weigh the issue and you make a decision. And I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve staff's recommendation and move forward. Second that motion. I, this is, uh, okay. <laughs> I will third that motion. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Douglas. Could you please read the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, slow to unmute there. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Chair Norton. Aye. Chair, the motion is approved. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will go back to item 80 now for completion, and then we're gonna move to item 93 since we have um, uh, our vice chair that may have to leave. So um, let's go back to item 80. We had some questions on the table and uh, we wanted to get some answers and we had um, the goal of also having Caltrans um, come and explain the process to us. But Commissioner Eager had um, wished to speak and ask an important question about this item. Ms. Erickson, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I did hear and and certainly appreciate your response that you could be in breach of contract if it goes past that date. Um, but because uh, the sale is contingent upon the CTC approval, um, I would certainly assume that if that's in your contract, that it is contingent upon this approval and the approval doesn't happen, that then you couldn't be in breach of contract. So maybe you could explain that to me. So, you know, that is likely uh, that is a clause in our standard contracts however you know in a in a court of law i think that they do have the um ability to bring forward a lawsuit that would uh say that we were in breach i'm not uh, very clear on what exactly the timing of their financing looks like and so if we don't approve before um, the first week of august to close escrow per the contract um, I'm not certain if they are in jeopardy of losing financing. I, I don't want to speak with real conviction on that point simply because I'm not absolutely clear, but that's certainly a possibility. And so we put this um, church at risk of losing financing and not being able to turn this particular property into affordable housing. But your contract is, it does, there is a clause in there that says it is contingent upon the CTC approval. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Because CTC approval cannot be deemed in contracts as being a rubber stamp. I just want to follow this up. It's it's an important point. We we have the ability not to give that approval, and that that should always be clear. Correct, Ms. Erickson. We are very clear on that. Yes, Chair Norton. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate. It. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. This is Carolyn Dabney, the program manager for Seventeen, and I just want to uh, elaborate a little further. If the commission denies this motion, the property would then go into priority five. So we do have that clause in the contract. So if, if it flat out denies, we would not be in breach. That is correct. But then we would go through the continue through the waterfall, which would be priority five, offering it to current tenants at fair market value. Then the city would likely file another writ, and this would be tied up in litigation for who knows how long. 
Okay. Um, we we still had some public testimony on this item, and we'd like to continue that because I think there is still a, a significant amount of concern that we have about this item, and we may put this back on the on the desk for a little while because we still want to determine about potentially postponing this, uh, given the issues in front of us. So, could we hear from public testimony, Justin? Thank you, Chair Norton. Uh, the only uh, attendee looking to make comment at this time that I see is Kathy Arau. Kathy? Kathy, you're unmuted and free to speak. Okay, we will work to get that sorted out, but I see no other attendee indicating they wish to make public comment at this time. Okay, um, I'd like to make sure that we had a chance to hear from Caltrans as to what process was followed and how this was in compliance with the Roberti Act, because I think it's important that, as we talked about before, that we give Caltrans a chance to explain the process and how we got to where we got today. Um, Ms. Erickson, do you wanna introduce your, your uh, colleague? Absolutely. I actually have a, a slide prepared. If I could do a very quick, maybe two or three slides, just to kind of do a walkthrough. Thank you. Wonderful. So, of course, we're here today requesting commission approval of the director's deed for a disposal unit located within the state route 710 corridor at 626 Prospect Avenue in South Pasadena. The property is a 12 unit multifamily property that's being sold to a housing related entity pursuant to the Roberti Act and the affordable sales regulations. So the governing statute for the disposal of the SR 710 properties is contained in government code section 54235 through 54238.9. Caltrans offered 626 Prospect Avenue for sale to housing related entities in 2019 and received three proposals. An evaluation panel consisting of staff from Caltrans and the California Department of Housing and Community Development reviewed the proposals. They conducted interviews with the housing related entities and unanimously agreed on awarding the property to Pasadena Friendship Community Development Corporation. Pasadena Friendship Community Development Corporation is associated with the Friendship Pasadena Baptist Church. It's a church with deep roots in the local community. Pasadena Friendship provided the best bid and Pasadena Friendship adhered to the regula regulations by submitting a proposal to buy, fix, and use the property as affordable housing. The city of South Pasadena has expressed their disappointment with the award to Pasadena Friendship believing their proposal had priority over other housing related entities because of their status as a designated housing related public entity. So I'd like to point your attention to the next screen. There we go, the screen to review the order of priority for the affordable sales program. So this property is being sold under priority four in green, which as you can see has its own priority waterfall for A through 4C. None of the proposals received indicated feasibility in de developing the property into a limited equity cooperative housing under priority A. We don't often see those. The evaluation panel then reviewed for proposals under priority 4B, which is to a designated housing related public entity. The definitions of a designated housing public related entity and the housing related public entity are kind of at the crux of the matter here and they're defined in the regulations uh, very clearly and they're shown on the next slide if you could advance so the evaluation panel determined that no housing related entity qualified as a designated public hre or housing related entity looking at the definition for a housing related public entity you'll see in bold text that a public entity can submit jointly with another public entity However, the city submitted their proposal jointly with a private housing related entity. 
Therefore, all the bids evaluated were under priority 4C, not priority 4B, as required by Roberti regulation. So this is in strict adherence to the regulation and, and we can't be discretionary with this. This is why the City of South Pasadena's proposal didn't receive priority over Pasadena Friendships. The department, of course, is aware of the public opposition to the award of 626 Prospect Avenue to Pasadena Friendship. However, the Roberti Act does treat tenants of multifamily properties different than tenants of single family properties. And that's very uh, important. It's, it's in the regulations as written and we can't be discretionary about how to comply with that regulation. Housing related entities have priority to purchase multifamily properties over tenants. And that is for multifamily properties, which 626 Prospect is in this case. Pasadena Friendship intends to operate the property as an affordable rental property. And while this eliminates the possibility of current op 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 occupants, excuse me, becoming homeowners, the regulations prioritize the use of multifamily properties by housing related entities as affordable rental units rather than home ownership. So the city has now filed a lawsuit and the Superior Court is well suited to determine the merits of the city's allegations. The hearing is scheduled for July 1st, 2021, with escrow scheduled to close in early August. And as we're all aware, the next commission meeting is sometime after that. The department will vigorously defend its action in Superior Court and respectfully requests the commission defer to the Superior Court's expertise in resolving the issues of law and fact in this matter. The affordable program regulations were developed by the department pursuant to its authority to adopt the regulations to implement, interpret, and make specific the provisions of Roberti. And the department is intimately knowledgeable of the Roberti statutes and the regulations and is confident in the award of 626 Prospect Avenue uh, and th that award to Pasadena Friendship was in compliance. We, ref we respectfully now ask the commission to approve the sale to Pasadena Friendship so that the department will be positioned to perform under the sales contract if and when the Superior Court rules in favor of the department. And uh, we would like to make sure that when the court does decide in favor of the department that we're able to perform in time to close escrow. But uh, Ms. Erickson, I, I feel as though our vote, we're having a chicken and egg issue because we're being asked to vote because this is going, this is going to be going before the court, but the court will take into account the vote of the CTC when deeming whether or not this was appropriate. Isn't that the case? I, I am not sure. I don't believe so. I mean, I think that the court might take into consideration what happens here today. Of course, um, the court would probably litigate or, or judge on the matters of, of law and fact in the case. Of course, escrow would absolutely not close without your approval. And I have a question about why, why see Caltrans isn't favoring the possibility of home ownership versus uh, keeping the tenants renters. This is an opportunity to build wealth and actually have this be quite a turnaround for the people who want to live in um, this area and continue living here and become homeowners. And, and I, I just wonder why in Caltrans's policy, that isn't something that's, that's valued since home ownership is such an important part of HCD's um, goals with the state. So that's actually not a, a Caltrans policy. That is part of the Roberti regulation where multifamilies are, are treated differently. And, and that's uh, absolutely pursuant to the Roberti regulation. And it, it's not policy. OK, that's not a discretionary item. To that us. point, Chair Norton, I think there is a Senate Bill 381 that is addressing that type of situation that has still yet to become part of law. Thank you. And that but but there is there is a goal i think that this is changing in terms of uh the the potential new bills that could address this you're saying john correct or yeah 
and and we still are waiting on the pending um, approval of the that legislation, as you had mentioned earlier, right, Kurtesh? Correct. Okay, uh, Commissioner Liu, you wanted to speak. Yes, I I do. Um, I have a question of Caltrans. Um, we were led to believe and because Caltrans didn't correct it, that the denial of the pro, um, proposed te uh, temporary restraining order was on the basis of the merits of the case. Was that the case or was it based off the hearing schedule and the escrow schedule that the TRO was denied? So I'm gonna tap in resident expert, Carolyn Dabney here, if I may. Sure, and I believe it was the latter um, based on the schedule. Okay. And uh, prior to today's commission meeting, I had asked staff about this item and I was told that there would be a breach of contract potentially if we did not approve this. Yet as Commissioner Eager has, pulled, uh, has pointed out, that's actually not the case. Mm -hmm. Correct. If you flat out deny it, we wouldn't be in breach. Okay. If you postpone it, we could possibly be in breach. Yeah. Now I understand in response to the possibility of our denial of this, Caltrans's position is that they would go to step five, which would make the current tenants pay fair market value for these um, residences, which- That's that's correct. Like, that's the Roberti Act. It's not policy. Um, yeah, well, am I wrong? but proposing to do that would also have to come back to us for consideration and approval. That's correct. I'm, um, I'm pretty disappointed and uh, I'm feeling a lot more like uh, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Tiho at this point, where <laughs> it seems that every opportunity Caltrans has had to screw this up, they have. I believe I was misled about the breach of contract. I believe I was misled about the TRO. And I believe that there was an implicit sort of, you know, misleading in saying that the next thing would be to go to step five. Um, at this point, I'd like to amend my motion and uh, change it so that we um, delay consideration of this item until our next meeting. I will. Um, I was the seconder of the initial motion. I will second the amended motion. The commissioner. Thank you. Will. Thank so you very much. If I, could just, if, if I could just clarify, technically our next meeting is June 30th. And so is your intent to defer it to June 30th or defer it to our August commission? I'm sorry, Mitch, because I'm on vacation on June 30th. I'm not attending that mm -hmm. meeting. I did not mean that. I, I meant our, our August meeting, meeting. Thank you for that clarification, Mitch. Thank you. Uh, Director, Weiss, Director Weiss, I assumed he was referring to August, and that was the basis of my second. Thank you very much. Uh, Douglas, can you please read the roll? Okay. Madam Chair, I'd like to just pause for a minute. We have a couple of written comments. Mm. Um, there was a comment a while ago from a John Vermouth. Um, he's under the impression that the court continued the TRO hearing until July 2nd. Okay, thank you. And then, and then the, another comment from Sean Abijin, um, the gentleman who wrote one of the letters. Tenants are prepared to also pay full market value and have obtained financing to do so. Why are the tenants being denied the opportunity to become homeowner of affordable housing? Thank you very much. We will address these questions when this comes up again in um, our August meeting, if this motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam uh, Chair. Douglas, we have please? The, Go ahead. We have the motion by Commissioner Liu, the second by Commissioner Gardino to delay this until the August meeting. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Uh, yes, I support the motion with the same disappointment that's been expressed by others. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. 
Mr. Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Chair Norton. Aye. Chair, the motion is approved. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, we are going to move to item 93. We have our ex officio member, uh, Laura Friedman, Assemblywoman Laura Friedman, Chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee. And we have Senator Portentino. And I believe we also have Supervisor Catherine Barger uh, ready to speak on item 93 as well. Teresa? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Item 93 is an action item. This is a supplemental funds request of $54.413 million for the I-5 HOV Empire Avenue and Burbank Boulevard interchange project in Los Angeles County. This project is segment three of four segments and the last segment to complete this corridor project. Once completed, the corridor project will have added approximately 10 miles of HOV lanes in each direction mm -hmm. and other improvements. I would like to note that this book item has two memos, one prepared by Caltrans and one prepared by commission staff. I'd also like to note that Caltrans memo was revised and was part of the yellows that was distributed to you on Friday. This supplemental funds request is to pay 34.2 million in construction claims and interest due to the contractor by June 30th, 2021. 4.3 million in contingencies 7.9 million to repair local streets, and 8 million for construction support. Caltrans proposes the additional 54.413 million of funding needed be allocated all from state funds, specifically 41.76 million from the Interregional Improvement Program of the STEP and 12.653 million from the Regional Improvement Program of the STEP. Staff has many concerns with Caltrans recommendation. Specifically, Caltrans recommendation states that STIP funds from the Regional Improvement Program be used for the local share of the cost increase. As indicated in STIP guidelines, STIP funds are state dollars. This is referenced in Government Code Section 14529 and Streets and Highways Code Section 164.1A3 and further alluded in the Streets and Highways Code Section 163 and Government Code Section 14524A. This is a state transportation funding source, not a local source. Caltrans recommendation also states that the funding agreements between Caltrans and LA Metro does not obligate either party to solely fund the cost increase. Guidelines clearly state that in the absence of an alternate cost sharing arrangement approved by the commission at the time of allocation, project costs, including increases in savings, will be apportioned in the same percentages as programmed. Government Code Section 14534 requires Caltrans to act in accordance with the program in carrying out their respective powers and duties. The program reference in this section is the adopted STIP program. Furthermore, on May 23rd, 2012, the commission approved a program amendment where 26.1 million of CMIA funds were removed from the I-10 HOV lanes project, Citrus to State Route 57, and reprogrammed the funds to the I-5 HOV Empire Avenue and Burbank Boulevard interchange project, which is this project. The adopting resolution for this action included the following statement. Be it further resolved that the commission finds that any increases in cost estimates from CMIA amended program adoption to finalize cost estimates are the, are the responsibility of the nominating agency. In this case, LA Metro is the nominating agency. This corridor project has gone through many iterations since 2007, when it was programmed as one project. It was later segmented into four projects, then later segmented, the segments were combined. 
Fine, funding has been adjusted, local and state funding has increased, and agreements have been revised and updated without commission action. The funding partners for the corridor projects for all four segments are LA Metro and the state. In general, cost increases are proportionally distributed by all fund sources that fund a project, unless there is a commission approved alternative cost sharing agreement. However, as noted before, the SNP guidelines are clear that in the absence of an alternate cost sharing agreement approved by the commission at the time of allocation, project costs, including increases in savings, will be apportioned in the same percentage as program. Although an argument can be made that there was a cost sharing agreement as stated in the program amendment in 2012, that the nominating agency would be responsible for all cost increases. Caltrans states that this project has had cost increases of 93.874 million. This amount includes this supplemental of 54.4 million and that LA Metro has already paid 39.461 million towards cost increases. Staff recommends this supplemental funds request be proportionally distributed based on the latest information provided by Caltrans, which shows a local distribution of 55.51% and a state distribution of 44.49% and take into account what LA Metro has already contributed uh, for the cost increases per Caltrans. The state fund sources that have funded this project include state regional and interregional programs, Proposition 1B Corridor Mobility Improvement Account Program, Proposition 1B State Local Partnership Program, the SHOP, as well as federal and, and local funding. However, most of the state funds used to fund the various segments of this project cannot be used to fund cost increases. Therefore, the only state funds that are available to fund the state share, the 44.49 of this cost increase, are, are step regional and from the regional improvement program and the interregional improvement program. The proportional participation of these two programs, per the latest information provided by Caltrans, is 93.45% for the regional improvement program and 6.55% from the interregional program. Therefore, using these ratios, staff recommends you approve a STIP supplemental allocation of 41,765,000 to distribute as 39,030,000 in the regional improvement program funds and 2,735,000 in interregional improvement funds. The remaining funds of 12,648,000 needed should be provided by the nominating agency, LA Metro, from not non-state sources, based on the proportional distribution from the latest information provided by Caltrans. Staff also recommends the commission request an audit by the Independent Office of Audits and Investigations to determine the proper distribution of funding based on the commission guidelines, programming, and allocation actions from the time the project was initially programmed up to prior to this action. In particular, those relating to the project budget and expenditures for all segments of this project. Once the audit is complete, the commission may adjust the funding distribution to correspond to their recommendation and our findings as a result of the audit. Mike Kiever, Caltrans Acting Chief Deputy Director, is here to present the technical aspects of this supplemental funds request. After Mike finishes his presentation, staff would like to make some final comments. Thank you. Mike? Thank you, Teresa. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good, good, good morning, uh, Commissioners. Uh, uh, I'm the acting deputy director here at Caltrans, and Tony Tavares, the uh, district director, is also uh, available to help answer any questions. Let, let me start by thanking uh, CTC staff. This has been a, a complex uh, book item, as Teresa has laid out, and uh, it's, it's a complex project. And so we, we've had many, many meetings, emails, exchanges of information. I do appreciate the collaboration. And I also want to thank LA Metro, our, our partner 
uh, in delivering this project. So this is the last of four segments um, uh, of what's nearly a $1 billion project on I-5 in Burbank uh, to add HOV lanes. It includes a rail project that was rolled into this, so there's rail grade separations and reconstruction of, of bridges and interchanges uh, in the Burbank area. Uh, like all complex, large comp uh, projects, uh, this one uh, had risks. Uh, we have a, a risk register, and we meet regularly with, with Metro to uh, identify and uh, manage those, those risks. Many of the risks were successfully avoided or mitigated, uh, but not all. And, and the first three segments uh, were successfully completed, and as I understand it, with uh, no request from the Commission on Supplemental Funds. That's not the case for this fourth, for this fourth segment. So as Teresa laid out, uh, Caltrans is requesting uh, about $46 million in construction capital and, and $8 million in construction support uh, in IP and RIP, so STIP funds, uh, the funds that are available to pay for these additional costs for, for claims uh, to repair uh, local streets that were damaged during the construction operations, uh, contingencies for ongoing risks and, and to complete the project. I do want to point out that it is important that we pay the contractor uh, to meet our legal obligations and avoid tying up their bonding capacity to go out and, and bid on more work. I was told there may be additional questions uh, uh, with relate, related to, to some of the elements of the supplemental request, but let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Uh, no, not yet. Um, I believe that uh, Director Tavares is here. I just wanted to make sure if you had any statements you'd like to make. I think we have a lot of people who are ready to um, give public testimony, and maybe we can ask you further questions after the public weighs in. Director Tavares, did you have any statements you'd like to make today? Thank you, Chair Norton and Commissioners. I, I think I'll uh, hold my comments until after we hear from the public. Okay, great. Uh, commissioners, if you could uh, hold tight. We have um, wonderful people who want to speak today, including our ex officio uh, Assemblywoman Sarah Friedman. So we'll start, I believe, with uh, Sen Senator Madam Anthony Pantino. Madam Chair, if, if, you, if, if you can indulge me, I, before you start public comment, can I have one final, my, uh, my final comment to you on this item? And um, one of the, the primary differences between Caltrans's proposal and the CTC's proposal is the definition of, of uh, what constitutes state funds. And, uh, you know, the, the statute is very clear that the state funds, um, the STIP funds are all state funds. And so I just kind of wanted to end my comments, just making sure that that is clear. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, of course. Um, Justin, could you open up our uh, public testimony? Yes. Thank you, Chair Norton. Of, of course, we have Assembly Member Laura Friedman. Thank you so much. Hi. Can you see me? We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. I think that you are going to take the Senator first, and that's totally fine with me. Okay. Thank you for your deference. Uh, Senator Portentino, are you ready? Senator Portentino, you are now muted. I, I am ready. Thank you. Can, you. can you hear me? We sure can. Awesome. There's a little bit of a delay, but I'll, I'll thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this item before the CTC and Caltrans work up to this point. Uh, and thank you to my colleague, uh, Assemblymember Friedman, for, for letting me uh, uh, go first. I appreciate that. Um, and I know Supervisor Barger is also here. Over the last uh, several, well, for forever, Burbank has been dealing with the burden of this project. And as you all know, there's been uh, construction delays, contract issues. Um, it, it's been a nightmare 
Um, and the city of Burbank has had to deal with that nightmare. Um, over the last two years, uh, Supervisor Barger and I have been working with Caltrans, the city, Metro, uh, to get us to this point. And uh, Tony Tavares has come in uh, over the last year and has been a, a breath of fresh air in those conversations. And we, we've come to an agreement to complete this project as quickly as possible, uh, deal with the city of Burbank's unmet needs list and get it behind us. Um, and Supervisor Barger's done an outstanding job working with Metro to get a funding plan in place. Um, I'm here to support the $54 million. Um, the, the request that Caltrans has made um, without any haircut. But I also want to make sure that we're clear that the balance of the unmet needs list that has been identified and agreed to that is in Metro right away, that we also have a game plan to make sure that everything gets completed. So today, I believe what's before us is, is a request for the full $54 million, which uh, I strongly encourage the CTC to approve, uh, but I also think we have to hold the contractor, uh, all interested parties accountable to make sure that we finish this project to the standards that we all uh, had at the beginning and that Burbank demands and Burbank deserves given what's gone on over the past several years. And so obviously I would encourage commissioners to uh, speak openly and candidly with Caltrans uh, during your discussion of this item to make sure that the commitments that have been made to the supervisor and I are going to be met um, and that the funding is put in place, not just the $54 million, but to make sure we also have a game plan uh, to finish the entire uh, unmet needs list. I know there are some right-of-way issues that need to be worked out with Metro, and there are some litigation issues that need to be worked out, but we sh shouldn't let that keep us from having a game plan to finish this with its full capacity. I appreciate the input of board members that have been in conversation over the last week to make sure that this uh, happens in a way that's fair to all parties. And I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage the full $54 million allocation today. And so with that, thank you for letting me uh, speak and thank you for giving your due diligence, auditing and figuring out what went wrong so we don't have this problem again is important. Uh, uh, I support those and I'm happy to to look at other measures to to bring further accountability and oversight and appreciate Caltrans working with uh, the supervisor in my office over the past year to get us to this point and CTC's consideration today. Thank you so much, Senator Portentino. Your input is so important here. And now we'll move to Assemblywoman Laura Friedman, our ex member of the CTC. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Chair Norton and uh, commissioners. And I want to first acknowledge the role that the Senator and the Supervisor have been playing um, in this project and thank them for their leadership in, in this. Uh, I'm not going to um, uh, restate everything the Senator just said. We are um, absolutely on the same page. I do want to amplify what a nightmare this project has been for the community. Um, everything from, of course, the, you know, so the, the construction impacts on the surrounding communities to the impact on neighbors who lost their landscaping buffers to uh, which you know without any adequate replacement you know mature trees taken out that were buffering entire neighborhoods of homes and now they they have no landscaping that that buffers them from the noise and the dust and the impacts of the highways um to very unsafe on-ramp and off-ramps for the duration of this project um making this section of road dangerous and and really frightening to drive on um, and the, of course, the timetables constantly being extended and lack of clarity for the community about when they should expect the projects to end. It's really been difficult. And I would absolutely echo the Senator's request that the full allocation be granted to help to make the community whole again uh, from this project. I also want to just um, elevate one other concern that we have heard from the San Fernando Valley COG and from other surrounding cities that they are worried that Caltrans, um, that, that the COGS and that those other cities are going to end up being on the hook for some of the gaps in funding for the project. Um, they believe that Metro is suggesting that the COG cities will have um, future funding from Measure R uh, may be made available to close some of the gaps. And you know that funding was intended and expected to go into other projects that uh, those cities have been relying on and planning for. So they're very concerned about the impact 
um, even on cities that aren't Burbank in the area, uh, having money siphoned away from them and from other worthy projects. And so I would ask the commissioners to make sure that that doesn't happen, that measure our money is not taken away from those projects and put into this project and um, that uh, that there isn't that trickle down um, negative impacts on surrounding projects and surrounding cities. And again, I would really, I can't overstate enough that Burbank really needs uh, uh, to have all of the ancillary impacts mitigated and all of those projects funded. Um, and so I would urge the commissioners to give that full consideration. Again, thank you all so much for your work and, and your diligence, and hopefully we can get this project finished um, soon and um, get the community some relief to all of these impacts of not just the highway that bisects the community, but also of this just you know endless construction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate these comments and we'll be coming back to you after um, the comments from um, Caltrans. Uh, can we complete public testimony next? Yes, up next we have Supervisor Catherine Barger. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Chair Norton and members of the commission. I appreciate the opportunity to address you on this important item for my district and actually for the greater Southern California region. As you are all aware, the I-5 serves as a backbone of international and interstate trade and commerce for the Western United States. And as we near completion of the I-5 North project, we can begin to see the benefits that will ultimately come from such critical infrastructure improvements. However, it has been a long and challenging road to get to this point. The project is significantly delayed over budget and has created ongoing burdens and impacts on the region, especially the city of Burbank. I recognize that this has been a complicated project every step of the way, from funding to design and throughout the construction. The state, Metro, and our local partners have had to wade through a seemingly, seemingly endless string of unique challenges. And while this project has been entirely managed and delivered by Caltrans from environmental through construction, I feel Metro has been a strong and a committed partner from the beginning. Our original local financial commitment of 523 million represented a 55% share of the project's life of project budget. And as the project has dragged on and required additional funding, our Metro board has been there each step of the way, fully committing 39 million in multiple life of project increases. But as we face additional increases to complete and close out the project, and recognizing that we have no measure of control over the delivery of the project, our board has taken the following position in regard to funding. We need to get back to a place of good faith partnership with the state and we have called upon Caltrans to be accountable. But I wanna to thank Tony Traveras for his relationship and partnering with us and really working in good faith. And I also want to acknowledge Senator Portantino um, for his leadership throughout this entire project. He has been engaged and has been a voice of region working and navigating with Caltrans. I also wanna thank Assemblymember Friedman for her testimony today and for her support. So I come to you with concerns about the posted CDC staff recommendation, which calls for the use of an additional tens of millions of LA County RIP funds to pay for the lion's share of the final LOP increase. These are funds that we have historically partnered with the CDC on to deliver critical transit infrastructure to meet regional and statewide climate goals and to address equity issues by expanding access to high quality transit options. I believe the original Caltrans recommendation better reflects the good faith partnership we originally shared on this project by more appropriately aligning the state and local shares with the original funding agreement. Throughout my decades of involvement with LA County, including the past five years as supervisor of the county's largest geographical district, I can say with confidence that we have enjoyed a great partnership with CDC. Together, we have delivered transformational infrastructure projects to every corner of the most populous and diverse county in the nation. And I believe together, we've only witnessed the beginning of what we can and what we will accomplish. So in closing, 
we cannot afford the future impacts of delayed action, I urge you to support Caltrans' recommendation, which better aligns with the spirit of good faith partnership that began this project and that the CDC and LA Metro have enjoyed for so many years. I thank you for your time and your thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Barger. Uh, Justin, next testimony. Up next, we have Will Ritter. Good morning, Chair Norton and members of the commission. I'm Will Ritter with LA Metro and appreciate the opportunity to comment it's on this item. As uh, indicated by our uh, director, Chair Barger, um, I wanted to recognize that uh, Metro uh, realizes that this is, item is complicated due to the fact that the overall project has been delivered in four segments with many different state and local fund types that were shifted between segments as necessary to address funding gaps and surpluses on each segment since construction began on the project nearly a decade ago. We also recognize that some of the Original state funding sources are no longer available for proportional increases or limited from cost increases by prior CTC policy. Metro feels strongly that we have worked in good faith with the state over this time to financially support a state highway project of true statewide significance that has been delivered entirely by Caltrans from environmental clearance to final design and construction. This local financial support has included the original commitment of over 55%, $523 million of the total party costs as well as an additional 39 million of prior cost increases. Based upon these considerations, the Metro Board took action to hold Caltrans fully accountable for these remaining project cost increases, along with the approval of a local funding loan to the state as needed to help address the payment deadline of the contract of claim. The Metro Board takes very seriously the accountability of the state to manage the delivery of the project within the project budget. We also fully respect that the Commission staff has, in the time available to prepare for this meeting, been unable to verify the overall accounting of the project and support their recommendation for an audit to be conducted by the Independent Office of Audits and Investigations to inform that process. And we also support the CTC staff recommendation to move forward with the supplemental allocation of state funding ahead of audit results to avoid further risks and financial penalties of the pending contractor claim that the department is obligated to pay by June 30th, 2021. Metro is, however, concerned for any further action by the CTC ahead of the audit results to establish specific funding source distribution of the cost increase, unless that distribution is consistent with the recommendations presented by Caltrans on this item. Metro strongly supports the Caltrans recommendation on the supplemental allocation that would include a state commitment of 41.7 million in ITIP and 12.6 million in RTIP with flexibility that Metro local funds could be used in place of the 12.6 million in RTIP. Any further commitment of LA County RIP shares would impact Metro's ability to fund other regional projects that are integral to the part of the Southern California Association of Governments Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy to support the region's ability to meet state greenhouse gas reduction targets, as well as the state mandate to transition our bus fleet to zero emission vehicles. These target investments are exemplified in Metro's current programming of our TIP funds to light rail transit projects, as well as bus replacements. If the CTC requests that an audit on the project be conducted by the Office of Audits and Investigations, we would ask that the audit focus on the overall project accounting and include an assessment of the nine funding agreements between the Metro Board and Caltrans, such that any inconsistency with commission guidelines and actions be addressed. For future project, considerations without impact to CTC action on the Caltrans recommended funding source distribution. Uh, we truly appreciate the ongoing partnership with the state on the delivery of these transformative projects in Los Angeles County of critical regional and statewide significance. And thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you so much, Will. Um, our next speaker. Next, we have John Bari. Looking to make comments? 
Good morning, and thank you, uh, Commissioners and Chair uh, Norton, for having us here today to be able to speak on this issue. My name is John Bueri. I'm the Executive Director of the San Fernando Valley Council of Governments. You've heard reference to by previous speakers. And I'm here to both echo almost all of our previous speakers and add a little bit more perspective uh, from our five member cities that are surrounding this project. Uh, we're pleased to see that this new funding breakout, breakdown between the state and, and Metro as described by Will previously, and that the cost overrun of this project has been reduced from where we started when this conversation first came to us back in uh, early 2021. Um, and that it doesn't really impact, hopefully, uh, as significantly the local coffers uh, of uh, the local region. So for reference, the San Fernando Lake COG was asked to convene a special board meeting in February to vote on this agreement between Metro and Caltrans to, to meet this gap that was raised at that time. The proposal was for the COG to sort of bless the uh, $73 million loan that Caltran, to Caltrans that would be repaid in 10 years for in-kind and monetary contributions, this interesting formula. And it was really uh, difficult for the board to make that decision, but they recognized the need uh, that the community had been waiting for this project, as mentioned, for so long, and there were so many issues surrounding it that we didn't want to delay it further. And we felt like there was no choice but to gamble these future funds to make sure we could get this done uh, for the community that we serve in, this, in the greater San Fernando Valley. So. Um, what happens is now Caltrans leaves these local government agencies and transportation agencies to juggle our future taxpayer dollars to complete this project that we, we've heard uh, time and again is led completely by Caltrans in this effort. So what we're seeing today is a vast improvement on the position that we were all in a few months ago, but as a cog, we should never have been in this position in the first place. Caltrans as the lead should be able to solve these issues. And we look forward to continuing to work in advance of these issues in the future uh, so that this doesn't happen again. Uh, this, the delays and the other things that, that were not accounted for uh, in d designing and overseeing this project hopefully will be revealed in the audit that you've uh, asked to be done and we support that doing that happening uh, because this issue is a flashpoint for the challenges that we face sometimes when we have local jurisdictions and local regional bodies and transportation agencies and the state working together to try to deliver for the, the constituents in a region. Uh, this is not the first time this project has had this issue in 2012. Uh, there was uh, reallocation from this region to other regions, and we really need to make sure that we don't see these complications continue in this or other projects for our region. region. Uh, this audit can help us operationally uncover the, the project management budget and expenditure for all the segments. And so we look forward to the results of that and carrying forward is what, uh, especially what Will was saying just before me in implementing uh, a solution that serves the community and respects the local jurisdictions work uh, to bring the best projects for their community. We thank the commission for bringing this issue uh, to this level and valuing uh, local government's representation and prioritization. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. <clears throat> Are there any next speakers, Justin? Yes, we have. Uh, one more attendee at this time. Uh, we have Kathy Arau. Kathy, you're free to unmute yourself and make your comment. All right, Kathy has remuted yourself. Uh, Kathy, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you at this time. Okay, it appears that the attendee is having uh, technical difficulties with their mic. So, and that is the last attendee at this time indicating they wish to make comment. Okay, um, it's my understanding that uh, Caltrans would like to speak. I did have one uh, question before Caltrans speaks, and that is that uh, Director Tavares and, and Mr. Kiever, this funding that we are about to approve today encompasses the totality of the remaining costs. You don't see any potential for other cost increases. There's already a, a, a expectation that this will handle all of the funds that are necessary in order to complete this project as so many people have testified needs to happen and needs to be done very expeditiously. And Chair Norton, if I may, this is Tony Tavares, District 7 Director. So uh, I do concur with your statement. We have uh, looked ahead to 
completing the project, identified any potential risks, and have included those potential risks, the cost of those uh, potential risks in this um, request that is coming to the commission today. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, Chair Norton, if I may. Yeah. This is Mike Beaver. So, just to follow up on Tony's uh, comment, we, we did uh, our request does look ahead at the risks. I, I also want to reiterate that uh, in this partnered projects, management of the risks has been shared in partnership. Many of the uh, claims uh, that we have with the contractor are based on decisions that were made early in the project. And, and so it's not a reflection that at the end of the project, there's, there's something uh, new coming up. So the uh, request to compensate the contractor is, is often comes at the end of the project, but it's not because of new issues. So as Tony is saying, um, we uh, addressed many of these risks early on, those are known. Uh, and so the settlement agreement with the contractor uh, is a certainty, if you will, and another reason that we do want to move forward with this. Uh, but we also, going to the points that were made uh, very well by others, we also share the goal of completing this, this project, uh, seeing the benefits and uh, reducing uh, the, the significant impacts that have happened to the local community. Thank you very much for both of your statements. Um, commissioners, do you have any comments? Madam Chair, if, if I can ask a quick question, um, and this is based on, on the, um, the first, um, I think, uh, Senator Portentino in the city of Burbank, in terms of the unmet needs that they have identified. Yes. Um, is your proposal in the, in the supplemental is that funding sufficient to address the needs that that the city has indicated? Sure, Norton, if I may, this is Tony Tavares again. Um, it addresses the majority of the issues that can be in included in the scope of work for this project. Just to sh uh, shed a little bit of light on this project, this. Uh, is segment three of a four segment I-5 North corridor. Uh, the, this segment happens to be the most complex segment or project to deliver as it was originally a highway project, which then added, included a railroad project into the project. So that added uh, several complexities to the delivery of this project. And there are a few unmet needs that are on uh, my understanding, LA Metro's right of way um, and an agreement right of way uh, agreement needs to be um, resolved or, or addressed between LA Metro and the Metro Link Railroad system there. That would not be included with this supplemental funds request. In my, my understanding, uh, that would be addressed as a separate project. Okay, so you don't anticipate this coming back to the commission for then additional funding? At this time, I do not anticipate that coming back. That is correct. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'd like to call on Commissioner Gardino. Chair Norton, thank you. And as we all look at this multi-year, um, nearly $1 billion improvements, I, there's nearly a billion reasons why we need to get this right for the ta taxpayers and traveling public of California. And I want to thank Teresa and Mitch for even making themselves available over the weekend to walk this commissioner uh, through the thought process as we all try to work together in good faith to move this forward, because we absolutely need to do this. Someone commented earlier, I think it was Director uh, Tony Tavares, that this is a project of statewide significance. I agree. I'm way up here in Northern California and often uh, travel down that way and uh, get stuck in that area because we're waiting on these improvements. So I want to thank Tony and his work within Caltrans, with LA Metro, and our CTC team to continue to move this forward. I'd like, uh, I'd like to make a multi-part motion 
uh, for our consideration uh, that I hope can build consensus as we build this project. Uh, part one, uh, that the commission requests an audit by the Independent Office of Audits and Investigations to determine the funding history on this project and proper distribution of funding and a report back to the commission. The distribution of expenditures across all segments should be based on commission guidelines and programming actions from the time the project was initially programmed, excluding any action taken today. Part two, the commission moves that 12,629,000 should be provided by LA Metro from local sources. The commission requests that LA Metro report back on the local fund type being used at our CTC August meeting. And part three, the commission move that 41,784,000 be allocated from the STIP in a regional improvement program to pay the Caltrans portion of these costs. And then we can address the issue of additional cost overruns uh, at our August meeting. Okay, there's a motion. Do we have a second? A second. I have seconds that. Okay. Uh, Douglas, could you please read the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes, sir. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Giger. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Mr. Martinez. Aye. Mr. Tavoloni. Aye. Chair Norton. Aye. Chair, the motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you all for your great work. And we look forward to um, coming back in August with a full picture of the completion of this project. Thank you so much, Director Tavares, for participating in this conversation personally today. Thank you very much, Chair Norton and Commissioners. Thank you. And thank you to all the electeds who came to testify for all of these items. Um, with that, we are going to go to item 82, the director's deed uh, for Laguna Beach, Ms. Erickson and Gertej. Thank you, Chair Norton. Just getting my camera on right now. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so commissioners, item 82 is an action item for a direct conveyance for zero monetary compensation. The conveyance of state-owned excess land is for Pestilozzi Properties, LLC, who leases the property to Annalise School in Orange County. The direct conveyance is to mitigate for a Caltrans safety project's impacts to the school's driveway entrance. Caltrans's proposed shoulder widening as part of the safety project will be impacting the ingress and egress of Annalise School's front, front driveway entrance. To minimize impacts to the school's driveway access, Caltrans offered the excess land in question for zero compensation, which in turn will be utilized by Annalise School for an improved and relocated driveway entrance. Please make note of the change list as there is a yellow supplemental associated with this item. If there are no other questions or comments, um, we can, I can give my recommendation or we can continue to item 83, Chair Norton. Uh, that's fine, you can go to item 83 as well. Okay, thank you. Item 83 is an action item to approve resolution HRU 21-01 to rescind a portion of freeway previously adopted for US Highway Route 101 in Monterey in San Benito County. The portion of Route 101 proposed for rescission was adopted in 1964 and was once considered for a future Prunedale bypass project. However, that portion of Route 101 was never constructed and is not part of any future local or regional plans. On March 26, 2020, the commission approved resolution NIU 20-01 to notify all affected local, regional, and state agencies of its intent to consider rescinding the freeway adoption. Approval of the route rescission will allow Caltrans to dispose of the excess land on the unconstructed portion. Furthermore, Monterey County has requested proceeds from the sales of the excess lands be diverted to Monterey County's 
Local Alternative Transportation Improvement Program. The county's LATIP has identified two projects that are intended to improve safety and operations. Staff has reviewed items 82 and 83 and recommends approval. Wonderful. Uh, we have no public comment at this time on either. Um, commissioners, do you have any comments? Questions? Make a motion, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Uh, do we have a second? Second, Eager. Thank you, Commissioner Eager. Uh, Douglas, can you please read the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Chair Norton. Aye. Chair, the motion is approved. Thank you so much. Our next item is item 84, the Local Alternative Transportation Improvement Program. Beverly. Good morning, commissioners. Tab 84 is an action item to approve the Local Alternative Transportation Improvement Program proposal and approve a local alternative project list for the US 101 Perndale Bypass Project. Due to the lack of a viable funding plan, the department requested to rescind the freeway route designation for the Perndale Bypass alignment, which the commission approved under tab 83. Pursuant to government code 14528.7, Local agencies in conjunction with regional transporta transportation planning agencies can submit an alternative state highway project proposal when a freeway route adoption is rescinded and excess property results from the action. The Transportation Agency for Monterey County and the Council of San Benito County Governments approved the two alternative state highway projects that local agencies identified as possible recipients of proceeds from the sale of properties on the rescinded routes. The two projects are included in the project list in your book item. The local alternative transportation program proposal and project lists are consistent with statute and staff recommends approval. Thank you so much. Commissioners, are there any questions? I'm going to move uh, approval. This is Commissioner Guardino. Thank you, Commissioner Guardino. We also have no public comment at this time. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, I heard Tavaloni first. So, uh, Gardino Tavoloni, uh, <clears throat> Douglas, can you please do the roll? Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Uh, aye, and with the permission of the chair, at the end of this vote, may I make a quick comment on this? Sure. Thank you. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Chair Norton. Aye. No. Chair, the motion is approved. Gardino, you're, thank you. Your, your comment, Commissioner Gardino. Thank you, Chair Norton. And I'll make this brief, but I think it's a it's an important reminder that the decisions we make on this commission not only impact um, the ease of commutes for our traveling public but the health and safety as well um, that seven mile stretch of, of 101 called prunedale had 77 entrances and on ramps uh, on that windy stretch of road and when I was a young legislative staffer in my 20s, uh, driving late on that road commuting at night, um, uh, a, a motorist came out of one of those 77 entrances and on ramps, almost hit me. I did three 360 degree spins in my car and miraculously didn't hit the sound wall or any of the other cars. This has been a hazard um for decades and the fact that we're continuing to make, make progress with today's motion and with other steps that we've helped fund on that dangerous stretch of road are a reminder three decades later uh, to me why this matters so much thank you for allowing me to make some extra comment thank you so much 
And we are glad that you came merged safely and could lead the CTC for as many years as you have. Thank you very much, Commissioner Gardino. Um, our next item is item 79, the status of the statewide construction stormwater general permit. Tim. Thanks, Chair Norton. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, item 79 is an action item. The current statewide construction stormwater general permit went into effect July 1st, 2010, and is currently under consideration by the State Water Resources Control Board for renewal. The draft was released by the State Water Resources Control Board on May 28th, and public review period ends on August 13th, which is prior to the August commission meeting. To ensure sufficient time to fully vet potential impacts, staff is requesting delegated authority to prepare and submit a letter after working with transportation stakeholders to analyze the draft permit language for potential project delivery implications. Delegating this authority would allow staff to transmit comments on behalf of the commission, including those already received from commissioners, to the State Water Resources Control Board within the public review period. Bill Stolarski, the Caltrans Chief of Division of Environmental Analysis, is here to provide an update on the status of the proposed construction stormwater general permit. Phil, are you there? You're on mute, Mr. Stolarski. You're still on mute. Can you hear me now? We can. Wonderful. We uh, thank you, uh, Tim and uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Phil Slarski. I am the Division Chief of Environmental Analysis uh, for Caltrans here in Sacramento, California. I'll be providing an update on the status of the reissuance of the statewide construction stormwater general permit uh, by the State Water Control Board, including uh, Caltrans concerns and potential project delivery impacts. Uh, next slide. So the first thing to outline, I will be talking about the uh, regulatory background, the reissuance timeline, the notable changes that may have minimal cost impacts and savings and notable changes that may have potential significant cost impacts and project delivery impacts. I do want to say that uh, my staff has been working collaboratively with the State Water Resource Control Board uh, to ensure that uh, our concerns uh, get the following outcomes. Number one, improve water quality, which is very important, provide a clear path to compliance for the department and without jeopardizing the delivery of transportation infrastructure projects. Next slide. So for the regulatory background, uh, this construct construction general permit regulates discharges of stormwater and non-stormwater uh, from construction sites. It applies to projects disturbing one acre or more of soil. And projects that disturb less than one acre are part of a water pollution control plan. They're not included in this permit. The last time the permit was adopted in 2009, it was effective in 2010. It expired in 2014, and administratively, the Water Board extended it until effective date of reissued permit. And the proposed CGP reissuance must implement existing regulatory requirements, including those adopted by regional water quality boards, not including the existing CGP. I do want to say concerning the last bullet, I know there are concerns from the construction industry related to these new regulatory requirements by the regional water quality control boards. I just want to state that, however, if the construction site assessment determines that there are no sources of pollutants at the site, no additional requirements will apply. If a construction site assessment determines that there are sources of pollutants at the site, then water quality sampling is only required if best managed practices fail to retain the pollutants, the discharges have then potential to cause the exceedance of the affluent limitations. Once again, if they're exceeded, then the treatment of the discharge is required. Next slide. This is the reissue. These are estimated dates. So back in February of, of this year, we met with uh, the Water Board, uh, Caltrans, uh, High School, Industry collaboration on the draft permit. 
Uh, we then uh, got, a, uh, uh, on May 28th, the, the draft CGP was released for public comments. Uh, and then on August 4th, we have this public comment period, which, uh, uh, excuse me, on August 4th, there's going to be a uh, state water board hearing. And then the public comment period ends on August 13th, as, as Tim pointed out. And so an adoption, then there's going to be a, a comment response period. And then there's going to be an adoption hearing to be determined. And when in consultation with the water board, asking them when that might be, uh, they estimated November, but they also recognize that they're going to get a, uh, a great deal of comments on the draft CGP. So with that, once the adoption hearing is, uh, we get adopted, it's anticipated that the effective date of the permit will be uh, July 1st, 2023. I want to discuss uh, some notable changes in the permit that may have impacts for minimal cost savings, uh, uh, minimal cost impacts and then some savings. So the removal of the event, the rain event control plans, these are often called re the REAP plans. So the plan is usually in a checklist form and is prepared prior to a forecast rain event. And it summarizes these, these best managed practices if there, in case there is a discharge of pollutants that they will capture that. And so the current draft 2001 permit actually proposes to remove the REAP, which reduces reporting requirements and a pre-inspection, but a pre-storm inspection is still required. So let's, let's reporting on that first one. Revised monitoring frequency. This, this will be some savings uh, realized due to the qualified precipitation events, and that's been redefined, which is, which is a, 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 actually a, a very positive thing in the, in, in the new permit. Basically, a precipitation event now is defined as 50% chance of rain, 50% chance of a half inch of rain. Okay, that's the new. Uh, the, and so this is going to expect it to reduce the number of inspections and monitoring event required, which allows our construction energy partners to focus on events where more value can be provided. And I think this is a good example of the collaboration uh, that we had with our resource control board, because we brought this up and they went back and they actually changed that definition. Uh, the third bullet, more efficient permit termination process. This is basically when a project explodes out uh, now, the, the draft permit states that there's an auto approval by the regional water board after 30 days if the regional water board does not take any action. So that's a positive thing. If we don't hear back from the regional water board, then the project is closed out. We, we're done with that project. The next item, requirements to minimize toxicity to waters when using passive treatment chemicals. Uh, this was added, it proposes to allow the use of passive treatment. So basically passive treatment is the application of any kind of natural or synthetic chemicals to, to reduce the turbidity uh, in the water. And that's basically the clarity of the water. Uh, in the past, we had to have active treatment plants where there was more equipment and more uh, labor to, to run those. Well, that's been a, a positive uh, uh, input into the, into the uh, permit. And lastly, the control of trash from construction sites. Uh, this is not a significant concern for Caltrans because our specifications require that litter be picked up at least once a week. And also our specifications also uh, require illegal dumping to be addressed by uh, change order work. Uh, next slide. So these are notable changes that may uh, have potential for Senate cost impacts. And so grandfathering. Existing projects required to transition coverage under the new CGP at an effective date could result in significant impact to publicly funded projects. So project budgets are established when the environmental document is approved. And so if there are, if we don't get this grandfathering, so what we're looking at and we're proposing, and we are working uh, closely with the water board on this. So a project would have coverage from the previous permits uh, as long as a contractor begins construction within X amount of years of the effective date of the new permit. So we're working with the water board to determine what that is. So once the uh, permit is adopted in, in 2023, for example, it wouldn't, these new requirements wouldn't be effective on projects that are already in the pipeline 
that it had a, uh, a proved environmental document or construction. And so that, that's a positive thing we're working with the water board on that. The numeric discharge limitations that apply to projects that discharge to specific impaired water bodies, including emergency projects. So the way they define an impaired water body, it's called a total maximum daily load. And this is the amount of any kind of pollutant that a water body can receive per day and still meet the water quality uh, the limits. And most of the TMDLs that are identified in this new permit are in Southern California. And so that's where uh, these, what they call the NELs, the, the numeric affluent limits uh, in the CGB are measured. And, 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 and we just wanna make sure that uh, we can actually attain those, uh, make those NEL uh, calculations and, and meet those minimum requirements so that we don't have any kind of action taken against us. And so we're working with the water board on that. And then lastly, increased stormwater professional involvement at construction sites. Uh, these individuals, these professionals, are, are called uh, QSDs and QSPs, so they're Qualified Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan developers or practitioners. And these are the individuals that perform that quality control, quality assurance on the job sites. And so there's concern that there uh, may be more uh, uh, reporting by them and also industry is concerned that then there may be a shortage of these professionals to do the work. Uh, next slide. And I believe this is the, the last slide. So we've been working on potential project delivery impacts for capital and support. And so once again, uh, we're working with the state, uh, with, the, with the water board on permit language and, it, and, and they'll be accepting comments uh, uh, through August 13th, and we're working with them on that. And so we're we're looking at uh, potential impacts that the functions that include planning, uh, project delivery, of course, and maintenance and operations. And so we're looking at those uh, requirements that may have impacts to our various programs. And a potential impact would be at the project level, we would have on the active construction, we have increased change orders. If there's gonna be an increase in the uh, sampling or measuring after an event, that's gonna potentially cause increased change orders. And then a project development process. For example, if, if, the, uh, if we don't get that grandfathering uh, uh, option for Caltrans, we may have to do some redesign uh, in the development of the project, which would then potentially change the parameters of the environmental document. But once again, we're working very closely with the water board you get that grandfathering language in. And then from a program administration perspective, you know, we'll have to do training and development and revise our stormwater management plan, potential uh, revised uh, specifications and standard plans, once again, documents and, and guidance. And then we will be providing uh, training statewide uh, with the new CGP. And that concludes my uh, presentation. Um, I had a question for you. Um, there's a lot of discussion about federal funding to augment the goals for um, the environment and public works and go look at, you know, stormwater runoff, bioswales, et cetera, better opportunities to cool pavement and to manage water. Do you, how do you see um, operating a lot of the, the programs that you have here and tying into some of the new proposals about modernizing the, the stormwater and other elements of roadways um, and, and seeking additional federal funds that they want to make available to do that, especially in uh, areas, states like ours that have heat issues and drought issues. Yes, so, uh, uh, Chair Norton, we, we always are looking at ways to improve our toolbox, what we call our best managed practices. And, and these are devices they, they, they include a structured and engineering type device or a bioswale where we can actually capture those pollutants before they get to a watershed. So we work closely with the water board that uh, ultimately approves those. And we work closely with our internally in Caltrans to get those, those uh, devices into our tool chest. So yes, we're always looking at ways to innovate and have more uh, ways uh, to, to uh, improve the water quality. Thank you. Uh, Justin, are there any public comments on this item? 
Uh, no, Chair Norton, I see no public comment at this time. Okay, great. Any comments from our commissioners? Oh, I see Commissioner Davis. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Norton. Um, so what sort of uh, cost analysis has Caltrans done on what the cost, cost difference is between the current plan and uh, the draft plan? Well, Chairman Davis, that's what we're currently doing right now. Uh, we received the uh, draft uh, CGP on May 28th when it was released to the public. So we're looking at, you know, active active construction projects. We're looking at projects that are, that are in the pipeline and what those impacts may be for pro to project delivery. So, that, so that I'll take it that if you don't know what the numbers are, we're not sure where we're going to allocate the funding to cover it at this point, right? Right. And also, you know, I just want to stress again that we're working very proactively and collaboratively with the water board. And once again, I uh, bring up that grandfathering clause. You know, I, I feel confident we're going to get a grandfathering clause in there. So that's going to be a less financial impact on our project. So we're doing analysis, but we also are confident that we, we, we'll, we can add some language to the permit so it will be a less impactful financially in our projects. And going to the grandfathering, um, are we, we're talking pre-construction, construction, and work that's already programmed, or what are we, I mean, how, how far are we going to be able to stretch on this so that we're not coming back trying to refigure how some's, how much something's going to cost? Yeah, so, uh, uh, Chairman Davis, what we're, what we're looking at in our strategy is to define, once again, at the approval of that environmental document, when are we going to have uh, some leeway to be to use the parameters of the old permit. So what we're looking at is to define X number of years uh, once e either construction starts and relevant documents complete that we can begin the, uh, you know, I don't know, two, three, four years after that, then we would then we apply the new requirements of the permit. Okay, a uh, couple, couple more things. Um, are we concerned that this is going to sort of create a new cottage industry of lawsuits, sort of like the sequel lawsuits that we see? Uh, I've been environmental now for about six years as a business chief, and I, it's very uh, litigious, so it, it could potentially uh, be that, uh, that that could happen. You know, each of the each of the regions, there's nine regional water boards, they have different requirements, so there potentially could be litigation that comes out of out of the permit for the requirements of the permit. And then, then the last, just the last point, I guess, is that you know these transportation projects are complicated already. Um, you know, projects go two miles; they go twenty miles, right? So it's a it's an ever changing job site. Um, I mean, I mean, what I mean it should be a well thought out process on how we're going to work with the contractors to make sure that they're able to comply, that there's the technology available available to help them comply, and then how it gets paid for, uh, you know, in the uh, in, in the entire process. And and um, I, I would say, is this an action item day or information item? This is a, an action item. I mean, I, I just don't know how we take action when some of the analysis that needs to be done is not finished. Commissioner Davis? Uh, this is the action on this is only uh, to delegate authority for commission staff to provide comments before the before the comment period is over. Since our meeting is our next meeting in August is after the comment period is complete. I understand. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've I've had a conversation with uh, our executive director about some other issues that I wanted to make sure were addressed, and uh, and so uh, okay, I understand. If I can add, uh, Commissioner Davis, we do recognize that we're, we're, we need to partner with our industry partners, our external stakeholders, and internally to put on that training of what the, what's going to be required with these new permit uh, requirements. So we recognize that. And we're, we're partnering with uh, our Division of Construction and other divisions of project delivery to accomplish that. I appreciate, I appreciate that. It's a, certainly an industry with a lot of quirks and, and moving pieces, and so making it more difficult uh, is is uh, we need to make sure we do the right thing uh, with the stormwater and runoff and all of that, but uh, also we got to make sure we keep these projects flowing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Davis. Uh, we have a, a person in the public who wishes to speak on this, and then 
I'd love to entertain a motion to allow us to provide comments only on this particular item, not approve the item to provide comments. Uh, Justin, can you give us our speaker? Yes, thank you, Chair Norton. Uh, we have Michael Quickly looking to make comment. Michael, you are free to make your comment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Quigley. I'm the Executive Director with the California Alliance for Jobs. Uh, the Alliance for Jobs is a labor management partnership representing the operating engineers, laborers, carpenters, as well as associated general contractors, the United Contractors. And uh, we are the men and women who build and maintain the state's infrastructure. Um, and because of that, you know, we're, we're really looking at uh, some major concerns with this permit. You heard some of the folks from uh, Caltrans uh, uh, Phil, I think, had some great points. You know, we're also very concerned about the grandfathering clause. Um, that currently not being included in the permit um, is going to have some significant uh, cost impacts to projects that are either you know, programmed or even underway. Uh, we think that is definitely got to change. Uh, we're also very concerned about the monitoring bottleneck, um, the amount and frequency, and also the window required for monitoring on job sites during rain events is it's just totally unfeasible in terms of the number of people who are currently uh, available to uh, the, the the construction industry um, so this is actually a significant bottleneck um, where you could have permits not being able to be issued for projects because there is nobody um, who would be assigned to be on quote unquote on standby for these monitor to cover during these monitoring events um, and so some of the other concerns we have that I think are equally significant uh, really and, and are specific to transportation uh, are around this new inclusion of the numeric affluent limits. Well, I'll expand on that real quickly and that the one of the major things that this new draft of the permit does is it moves us away from uh, a sediment based approach and starts including metals into these um, pollutant testing criteria. And that is something that we currently don't have in the draft permit. And some of the metals that they're including um, in these areas where they want to implement the NELs in, in Southern California uh, are metals you know, like copper and zinc. And those metals are commonly found in brake pad dust. So you have a situation where uh, virtually any transportation project um, that would be subject to a metal-based NEL that has copper and zinc in it would be um, not in compliance from you know day one and given the situation where you have a you know an active uh, right away with uh, personal vehicles you know coming in close proximity to the job site you know you would not be able to control additional amounts of these metals entering in and uh, you essentially create a, a, a situation where no transportation project could comply with these terms of the permit um, so i think that's something that our industry is definitely going to focus on um, you know, we're very concerned about the cost of implementation. You know, I hope Caltrans can really provide some numbers on that. You know, it's not necessarily a question of priority. It's a question of, you know, where is the money going to come from? And I think that's a that's something we can talk about uh, in the public, the public space around this. Uh, you know, the feasibility for implementation on transportation is a huge issue. You know, and finally, the expansion of the legal legal liability and risk. This permit would also expand who is allowed to um, file suit and essentially would put both the contractor and project owners at greater risk for a citizen-based lawsuit from you know, individuals or NGOs. Um, and we think that there's a lot better approaches that can be done in terms of a permit that instead of creating a numeric affluent limit where instantly the, the contractor is in violation and is now uh, has a notice of violation on the record, and becomes a you know essentially a polluter. Um, there are other approaches that we could do that would improve upon the BMP model, as Caltrans was talking about. Uh, and in fact, the industry has convened a group of some of our biggest contractors: Granite Construction, Tiger Construction, uh, Flatiron, Qit, and uh, Scanska are going to be working with uh, some of our industry coalition and consultants. So we're going to be putting forth. Um, some ideas we think that can actually help improve water quality that would be supported by the construction industry uh, that can do some of the same things that they hope to accomplish in the permit, but don't require um, some of these other uh, measures that we find totally infeasible. So we want to be a good partner on this. We obviously care a lot about water quality, just like everyone else. Uh, and we think we can get to the same place without having to go down this route. 
and uh, continue to support transportation infrastructure and uh, not create bottlenecks and, and move our state forward in that regard. So thank you for the time and we'll be in touch on this issue. Thank you so much. Um, with that, could we get a motion on um, allowing the CTC to provide comments on this item? I'll moved, Commissioner Eager. Thank you, Commissioner Eager. Do we have a second? Abalone, second. Excellent. Uh, with that, Douglas, could you please read the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. <laughs> Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Chair Norton. Aye. Chair, the motion is approved. Thank you so much. Now we are going to take items 179 and 180 together. Thank you, Chair Norton. Commissioners, item 179 is an action item to extend the period of project completion for five projects per shop guidelines. Staff recommends approval of these time extensions as shown on the time extension table that had been previously distributed. Move it, Tavaloni. Okay, uh, do we have a second? Second, Mr. Davis. Okay, we have no public comment on this time on these items. So Douglas, can you please do the roll? Madam Chair, can we have a clarification on the motion because we were going to take 79 and 80, uh, but we only introduced 179? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's do uh, 180. I'm sorry, Elika, and then we'll do, we'll, we'll keep the motion on the table, but just present uh, 180 for us. Thank you. Okay, great. Commissioners, tab 180 is an action item to consider project completion extensions for two projects in the active transportation program. These requests are consistent with ATP guidelines. Staff recommends approval of tabs 179 and 180 as shown in the pink time extension table. Thank you. Now with that motion, which was understood, uh, Douglas, could you please read the roll? Thank you, Alika. Commissioner Tavoloni. I'm sorry, Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Liu. Sorry, aye. Thank you. Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye, thank you for the two votes. <laughs> Chair Norton. Aye. Thank you so much. And now we are going to move to items 181 through 190, which will be taken together. Thank Sheila? you, Chair Norton. Thank you. Commissioners, item 181 is an action item to extend the period of project, de excuse me, project development for 17 projects per shop guidelines. Staff has reviewed these items and re recommends approval at the end of this section. Thank you. Casey? Mm -hmm. Tabs 182 through 184 are action items to extend the project development expenditure deadline for 10 locally administered SNP projects. Staff has reviewed these requests and finds them consistent with the SNP guidelines and interim timely use of funds policy. Staff recommends approval after the end of this section. Okay. okay. Hannah? Yes, commissioners, uh, tab when, I'm sorry. Okay, um, this is a request for uh, an expenditure extension for design for a project at the border. Um, it's the result of a value analysis workshop that was done to get consensus from all stakeholders on the best way to handle some gas lines that run through the project area. Um, the final decision was made to relocate the gas lines around the port, but the, this um, additional value analysis workshop took time and it 
it impacted their schedule and that's why they're requesting the design extension. Staff have reviewed this request and recommend approval. Tab 186 is an action item to extend the project development expenditure deadline for the Concord BART Station modernization project in Contra Costa County. Staff has reviewed this request and finds it consistent with the SIP guidelines and the interim timely use of funds policy. Staff recommends approval after the end of this section. Commissioners, Tab 187 is an action item to consider project development expenditure time extensions for 12 projects in the Active Transportation Program. These requests are consistent with ATP guidelines and staff recommends approval after item 190 is presented. Good morning, commissioners. Tab 188 is an action item to approve the period of project development expenditures for one local partnership formulaic program project, the Santa Monica Road and Via Real intersection improvements project in Santa Barbara County. Staff recommends the time extension period of 12 months for the plan specifications and estimates phase and the right-of-way phase. Tab 189 is an action item to approve the period of project development expenditures for one local partnership formulaic program project, the Cabrillo Boulevard Pedestrian Improvements Project in Santa Barbara County. Staff recommends the time extension period of 20 months of the plan specifications and estimates phase and the right-of-way phase. Tab 190 is an action item to approve the period of project development expenditures for one local partnership formulaic program project, the West Santa Ana Branch Transit Corridor Project in Los Angeles County per the interim timely use of funds policy. Staff has reviewed the time extension request and the items are consistent with the guidelines for the following programs. ATP, local partnership, shop, SIP, trade corridor enhancement, and the adopted interim timely use of funds policy. Staff recommends your approval of tabs 181 through 190 as shown on the pink time extension table on the change list. Thank you very much. I believe uh, we do not have um, any public comment at this time. Justin, can we confirm that on these items? Yes, Chair Norton, that is correct. No public comment at this time. Thank you. Uh, I hear none from my colleagues about questions on these items. So, Douglas, would you please read? Could we have a motion on 181 to motion. 190? Motion to approve, Gordina. Thank you. Can I have a one second. Thank you. Douglas, can you please read the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Chair Norton. Aye. Chair, the item is approved. Thank you very much. Next items. We'll be taking 191 to 197 together. Um, commissioners, item 191 is an action item to amend previously approved contract award um, time extensions for two projects for the shop guidelines. Staff has reviewed these items and recommends approval at the end of this section. Madam Chair, I think, um, Sheila, I think we're, we're taking 191 through 196. You said 197. Oh, OK. OK, uh, thank since, you. Mm -hmm. Tab 192 is an action item to amend a previously approved time extension for the Gregor Johnson Road Reconstruction Project in Plumas County. The agency originally received a 12-month allocation time extension for the design phase in June 2020. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the county is requesting an additional eight months for a total of 20 months to allocate the design phase. Seth has reviewed this request and finds it consistent with the SIP guidelines and the interim timely use of funds policy. Seth recommends your approval at the end of this section. Commissioners, tab 193 is an action item to consider amending the period of project completion for the City of Garden Grove's first mile bicycle and pedestrian trail expansion on the Pacific Electric right-of-way and education and encouragement activities project. Staff finds this time extension amendment consistent with the interim timely use of funds policy and recommends approval after item 196 is presented. Tab 194 is an action item to consider amending the period of project completion time extensions for two City of Los Angeles projects in the Active Transportation Program. 
the Safe Routes to School Education and Enforcement Programs and Pilots Project, and the Top 50 Safe Routes to School Safety Assessments and Travel Plans Project. Because of the extraordinary circumstances caused by the COVID-19 pandemic resulting in school closures, the city has been unable to conduct these non-infrastructure projects. Therefore, Commission staff is recommending these time extensions be deferred until the City of Los Angeles is able to assess when they can successfully complete these non-infrastructure projects. Thank you so much. Commissioners, tab 195 is an action item to approve amendment, amendments to previously approved allocation to a previously, excuse me, approved allocation time extension request for one local partnership competitive program project in Los Angeles County in accordance with the adopted, adopted interim timely use of funds policy. Tab 196 is an action item to approve an amendment to a previously approved time extension request for the period of project development expenditure for one local partnership formulaic program project, the Low San SD subdivision signal respacing optimization project in San Diego County in accordance with the adopted interim timely use of funds policy. Staff has reviewed the time extension requests and the items are consistent with the guidelines for the following programs, shop, STIP, ATP, local partnership, and the adopted interim timely use of funds policy. Therefore, staff recommends your approval of tabs 191 through 196, as shown on the pink time extension table and the change list. Thank you very much for these items 191 through 196. Do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Tavaloni. Uh, Douglas, could you please read the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Thank you. Gordino. Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tabaloni. Aye. Chair Norton. Aye. Sure, the motion is approved. Thank you very much. And now with um, 197, I need to recuse myself while I have not had any financial relationship with this project as a commissioner. Before I was a commissioner, I did work on this particular project. So even though this is not a financial matter, it's just a time extension with an abundance of caution, I'm gonna recuse myself on this item. Thank you. Alika, before you begin, um, the commission guidelines, or excuse me, operating procedures state that in the event of the absence of both the chair and the vice chair from any meeting, the members of the commission present shall elect a chair from their number to preside at that meeting. So I therefore request the, ch the commission elect a chair to preside over item 197. I'd like to move Commissioner Joe Tavaloni. Second. Second. Uh, Doug, can you call the roll? Thank you. Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tavaloni. Aye. The election of the chair is approved. Okay, uh, with that, Joe, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to hand it over to Alika for her presentation and then the vote on this item. Okay, commissioners, tab 197 is an action item to consider amending the period of project development expenditure for the active transportation programs downtown LA Los An excuse me downtown LA arts district pedestrian and cyclist safety project location located in the city of Los Angeles staff finds this time extension amendment consistent with the interim timely use of funds policy and recommends approval as shown in the pink time extension table 
Moved by Commissioner Lou. Second by Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Commissioners. Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni, the motion is approved. So I have I have sent a, a text message to uh, Chair uh, Chair Norton that she can jump back on. Oh, and there she is before I even look up. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Justin. Do we have any public comment on all matters before us before we end our meeting? Yes, Chair Norton. Thank you. We do have one written comment at this time. <clears throat> This written comment comes from uh, Kathy Arau, who was having technical difficulties earlier in the meeting. Uh, this written comment pertains to item 81. She writes, I'm a third generation Niles native and my father worked at the Pacific State Steel Mill in the early 1950s. This road or whatever it's called these days has always had issues and now Union City has been handed this when Mr. Haggerty didn't want to have a potential lawsuit and environmental issues still are at hand with the digging up of the contaminated land and potential for contamination of the aquifers at the Niles Cone Basin. I know that there is not enough funding from Union City for this road to nowhere and the disruption to the residents of Fremont that this road will be placed next to and crest a buffer of land next to the residents of Union City. This multiple lane parkway is directly uh, next to the old Alameda Creek and the effects on wildlife that live in the creek like deer, foxes, wild birds, frogs, and migration of ducks. There is litigation already started for another project that has a potential impact that was filed by the Laborers International Union by attorney Rebecca Davis of the law firm, the law firm uh, Lozal Drury. So please reject this sell of property and rethink what and who will benefit and the possible effect this will cause. Thank you. And that completes all public comments submitted during this time. Thank you, Justin, for reading that with such gusto. I did want to make sure that this comment was added to the file for item 81. Will that be the case? Yes, Chair Norton, that will be the case. Okay, wonderful. Um, with that, commissioners, we will be adjourning. Do any of you have adjourning motions for us today? Okay. Move to well, adjourn. Not, then I am pleased to say that we are adjourned. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Have a great day. Until our July 30th meeting and then our August meeting. June 30th. We are adjourned. June 30th. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Thank Chair you Norton. Very much.